My name is Joe Pollock. Can call me Pollock. Okay, so I'm from East Nottingham, in East, uh, Malaysia. All right. So before I start, I would like to keep, give a give a uh, short introductions about um, Malaysia. Okay, Malaysia. I believe everyone knows as Malaysia because we are neighbor country. So just a little background about Malaysia. We are around thirty three uh, population country. Uh, Populations in the earth, yeah, we are for the third most population. I think compared to Indonesia, we are small country. We have 30, uh, 30 state, uh, our capital uh, is located in Kuala Lumpur. Right, so let's break up about Kuala Lumpur. So hopefully after the pandemic, you can come to visit Kuala Lumpur. We have a, uh, we call it, this is a KL Tower. A single tower used to be the taller tower together with this uh, twin tower. It's very beautiful view. So we have three major races. We have uh, Malay, uh, Chinese, and Indian. That's why we have different type of food. I think our the variety of food is similar to Indonesia. Right. So uh, the bigger about the University of Nottingham, as we know, we are global university. We have three campuses. The first university uh, campus located in the UK. We have around 35,000 students. Then the second campus located in Ningbo, China. So around 7,000 students. And the campus located in Malaysia is Semenye, Kuala Lumpur, or we have around 5,000 students for information. China and Malaysia is a private university, while UK is a government university, is a public university. All right, so a little bit about our position. We are used to be a top 100 uh, university worldwide. So we are global networking uh, and collaborations. We are eight in the UK, 97 of our research at the university is international, uh, internationally uh, recognized. That's why we have three campuses, right? We have a lot of fundings, yeah, because we have funding from UK, Europe, China, as well as Malaysia. We have world-class facility as well. We have 3,000 researchers just focused on research. Right, so just a little background about um, our partner and stakeholder. In the center of the research ecosystem, we have faculty, which is we have three major faculty. We have faculty of science and engineering. We have faculty of uh, social science and we have faculty of uh, this, uh, business as well. So in the, in the outside this uh, faculty, we have uh, five global research team and 25 interdisciplinary research cluster. So we have World Craft facility and infrastructure award winning environment. That's how we can produce a, a two Nobel Prize award winner from our university. After this, right, we have uh, six become excellent Currently, I'm the leading of the future, future food. Of course, this is nine UK uh, Research Institute funding opportunity and our research goal. Right, so uh, as Dr. Hilly that I mentioned that I will, read, I will give a quick introduction about myself. Currently, I'm the technology advisor, high tech, high, uh, high radio, high tech and culture ministry, uh, under Ministry of uh, Science and Technology in Malaysia. I'm also president of International Bioprocess Society in Malaysia, director of Food Processing Research Center in East Nautical Malaysia, as well as uh, co-director of Future Food Malaysia because excellent in Minister of Nautical Malaysia. That's why you, anything related to food, anything related to future food, uh, yes, I'm the person, right person to contact. Yeah, I also a food professor just promoted become a food professor, I think last two years ago. So uh, relative a uh, young professor in biochemical engineering. I got my PhD quite earlier, yeah, quite faster. It's two years time in bioprocess engineering. Uh, in University of Putran, Malaysia. Right, I also, uh, right after a PhD, I put another degree, we call it Fellow of Higher Education Academic in two years' time. That's why I currently a Fellow of Higher Education Academic. So I just, I also got a Chartered Chemical Engineer, which is if I can be. Also, Professional Technology Research Board, Research Board of Technology, uh, of Malaysia PN as well as professional technology registered with Malaysia Board of Technology SPTEC. So you can see a title with IR is a professional engineer, TS is a professional technologist. All right, just a quick area of research, right? I'm focused on bioprocess from upstream to downstream. Yeah, more to cultivation, fermentation of micro. Yeah, some example microalgae to uh, uh, bacteria enzyme to a uh, downstream processes, right? Focus in separation and preparation engineering. We have developed a new method we call liquid bioprocessing system, right? We also recently I'm also work a lot in deep microalgae biorefinery. As you know, microalgae we have meat bioprocessing, biomass bio. Uh, refinery and bar product, which can produce different type of products. So this is my area of research. Right, just a quick cap of my research achievement. Right, I have published around five hundred high impact factor in less than eight years. Quite productive. Majority is Q one paper. I also successfully extract a lot of fundings like uh, international government and uh, industry fundings. So I this year I also received an award record Dan Sri uh, Emeritus uh, Professor Augustine S H Ong uh, International Special Award on innovation and invention in palm oil in 2021. Also, uh, 2020 outstanding uh, reviewer in water environmental research, top two uh, world leading scientists by Stanford, this 2020. APEC 
uh, Science Prize for Innovation, Research and Education, S Prime Malaysia Award 2020, Six Global Peer Reward World Wide Web of Science at Park Block, and also Young Research Award from Malaysia, Most Read and Most Talented Paper, Thai Civil Award given by Society for Biotechnology, Japan's which is Special Award given by Japan Government, JSPS, which is the uh, Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, which allowed me to have a three, three month uh, attachment in Kobe University. Also, Elsevier. Uh, top peer review award. So I'm very active in this uh, doing review task. Top 100 Asian Scientists 2017, Asian Research 2017, winner of Young Researcher Award to ICAMI, and also Platinum Research Award from the University of Malaysia. Since, since I joined the university. All right. So uh, of course, all these achievements did not belong to me. I currently have uh, 14 PhD and four MSD students ongoing. Right, so I would like to thank all my experienced students. Today we have speaker from Dr. Apura, Dr. Chiu, and Dr. Cherry. Right, of course we have uh, more uh, students who yeah, are already graduated and they are working in other countries. We are close cooperator. Without them, definitely we cannot have so much achievement. Right, so uh, I would like to thank all my international collaboration as well from Taipei, uh, from New Zealand, United States, China, Japan, Vietnam, of course for others, yeah. I, I think I forgot to add uh, from Indonesia, Dr. Healy is one of my close collaborators from Indonesia. So whenever there is any collaboration, definitely I will look for Dr. Healy. All right, so today topic for world-class professor, I will talk about the future of biochemical engineering. So by the way, what is biochemical engineering, right? Biochemical engineering actually is, is combination of biotech plus the chemical engineering, right? So what is biotech? Biotech actually is the application of scientific and engineering principle to the processes of material by biology and agent to provide good and services, right? So something is keyword is uh, which is uh, by using the scientific and engineering principle to provide good and services, right? So biochemical engineering the is the meaning of the contribution of chemical engineering to biotech. So meaning that we are contribute something to the biotech. So this is something that we contribute. You can see uh, for in the biotech context, we can contribute in chemical engineering through biochemical engineering skill. Right, of course, there is another uh, element such as biochemical. We're using protein engineering to contribute to the biotechnology. Right, so where can biochemical engineering be applied? Right, so all applications benefit from the input of chemical engineering principle, although the case might be same as some encounter in the traditional oil and chemical industry. So some skill are small, example, like a healthcare industry, which is very small. But in some large one with, with environmental and wastewater treatment, which is the last skill, large plant. So these are some of the contribution that can come from biochemical engineering. Can be chemicals, food processing, agriculture, environmental energy, and healthcare. Right. So some of the uh problem that only biochemical can solve. I can share, share some of the example. Example, which is a director design and optimization. Right. So related to fermenter. Biocatalyst, some of the bias, bias separations and uh, purification, which lead to biomolecular, which is some of because you need uh, the, the knowledge of separation, some of the knowledge from the biotech, which is from biomolecular. And also control drug release. Now, this is very hot topic because we have a vaccine. So that's why the, the drug that released to our body we need the suitable time to release, not all the way they release is all, all the media. That's why you need to control drug release. Tissue engineering, which is scaffold for tissue engineering. Yeah, this is also important because it's combining of uh, biotech together with engineering uh, knowledge. Also, extractive technology, which is a system by the which is combining upstream and downstream, and also biorefined technology, which is a resource recovery. So recover from the uh, resources that we have. All right. So some of the information, what is why we're talking about biorefinery, what is biorefinery? All right. So there is two uh definition widely used by uh IEA, which is International Energy uh, Energy Agency. Another use value used in uh, NREL, which is a National Renewable Energy Laboratory from US. So the biorefinery definition can be divided into biorefinery is the sus uh, uh, sustainable processes of biomass into spectrum of market, marketable product and energy. So this is definition by IEA. Right, so another very similar uh, definition, which is by uh, NREL, which is National Renewable Energy Laboratory. A biorefine is a facility that integrates biomass conversion processes and equipment to produce fuel, power, and chemical from biomass. This is the keyword is biomass. So, meaning that anything uh, in the process that produce biomass uh, produce uh, this uh, 
fluid, uh, fluid uh, power and chemical from biomass. All right, so definition of biorefinery actually can be start from a micro okay? which we are working on it. So micro okay, will lipid, protein, pigment, carbohydrate, this agar biomass. Undergo a pre-treatment can be sonication, can be microwave, enzymatic, hydrothermal, Okay, all this is a pre-treatment. They undergo, we produce three products with carbohydrate, lipid, and protein. So undergo for carbohydrate until fermentation, we produce some bioethanol. While biodiesel undergo transfiguration, we produce uh, butano and lactic acid. While protein is direct changes, we produce uh, some uh, products such as fertilizer. Then this all can be undergo for them. Uh, undergo wastewater treatment in flume, then we can produce again. So this is, we also call it biorefinery and circular economy. Okay, first, uh, biorefinery concept actually is a combination of this biomass to become a biorefinery. They have a product, example, product with bioenergy, chemical and material, fuel and food. So, of course, you need to be sustainable. They need to have life cycle analysis, environmental damage and investment cost, and social impact. All right, so the future of biorefinery can be divided into few. The first one is first generation biorefinery, which focus on food, feedstock, such as sugar cane. Uh, corn and concept, concept, and also second generation such as lignox and biomass, and the third one which is third generation is which focus on algal feedstock, and the fourth one which is uh, focus on uh, genetic modified raw material, and which was the fifth one. Fifth one definitely there is something that more at once incorporate with the Internet of Things. Alright, so when we combining microalgae to with bio uh, biorefinery, we call it uh, microalgae biorefinery. Microalgae actually start from microalgae. Then we undergo refinery example the final product right protein carbohydrate lipid and pigment. Then we are ready to go to market so we can say it's high value product community biofuel. All right, so sustainable sustainability of micro uh, microbe biofuel of course start with cultivation harvesting biomass oil biofuel ceramic which is combined of the techno economic social environmental. So this is sustainability study. So the cost-effective techniques we came from this. This is some example of it, right? So you can see this is some uh, carbon sequestrations. So undergo uh reduce the carbon sequestration, also increase the ecology uh biodiversity diversity. So this is the carbon dioxide from the factory. Undergo this uh use it for microalgae cultivation in the uh microalgae micro micro cultivation point. Then you can recycle the product again. So you have some products like as part itself, biogas, biofertilizer. Then pigments, plastic, high, uh, by hydrogen, by ethanol. So this is important one is cost effective that makes low and uh, energy requirements. So some of the biochemical engineering is now is not new to us. As I mentioned to you, we are focusing a lot in bio process from upstream to downstream. We also do a lot of separation and peripheral engine, and we we'll work a lot in biorefinery technologies. So some of the case study that I would like to share with you, this is the actual technology in liquid biophysics system. So this is actually is one stone killing more than two, but how we do it actually, you can see this is a one phase forming component plus the fit fit, which is neutron and medium together with microalgae. Okay, we cultivate it using uh, this uh, cultivation system using different medium. So we, after the hour system, we stop aggregation, we heat it above the critical solution temperature. In that case, we cannot heat too high because we give it a uh, live organism. We only can heat until uh, 40 to 60, so 80 degrees Celsius. We have formed the two phases. The top phase consists of byproduct plus the water. You just remove the water, you get a pure product. While bottom phase consists of concentrated phase forming component plus the biomass, which you can recycle the biomass. So this is how we do the extractive technology. We combine upstream and downstream together. Of course, this the purity is not that high, but this is uh, some preliminary uh, separation method that can be done. So can can reduce the all the multi, multiple uh, phases unit operation in this downstream processing. Right. So some of the case study we'll share with you that are uh, asymmetric cultivation and bio refinery techniques. So you can see of it. So this is how to do the uh, extractive technology in liquid biophysics system. So it's a single step extraction. So we let it do the cultivation of it. Then after cultivation of it, we heat it up to critical social temperature. We form two phases. The top phase you can see more or most of the biomass will go to the top. While bottom phase is consists of water. And after you heat it up to critical social temperature, right, the biomass will break the cell wall. After break the cell wall, all the product will flow into the top, which is a oil layer on the top layer. And the biomass we can some of the recycle and and the middle one is the clear with this water. Of course, we are now working on it. We have put some 
sensor on it, we can measure the water content, pH, control the pH, and control the mass concentration. So we make it into a smart aqua technology in the pipe system. So this is how you can see. Yeah. So you can see this is a thin layer of uh, oil. Middle is a water, and the bottom is biomass. You can recycle the biomass. So this is how the aqua technology in the pipe system. So let me share with you. Uh, we are doing a uh, bio transformation of algae to high value products. So this is how we do it in our lab. So we can see we're doing cultivation using a flotation system. So after flotation system, right, we extract the using the same system. This is a layer of biomass. Okay. So future prospect in biochemical engineering. So I can say uh biochemical engineer are creator who have studied the natural chemical functions organism and draw a new scientific knowledge to make product or to refine the, what the things are processes. Okay, some of the uh, biochemical engineering sector industry, we can see this is uh, from, from biology, water treatment, bioremediation, chemical, cosmetic, food and beverage product, government, department, agency, mineral and energy, pharmaceutical and research development. Some of the career pro uh, progression, we have uh, biochemical engineering. This is uh, what we are doing right now. We are producing a uh, process engineer, chemical engineer, uh, then we have biomaterial, mineral, uh, engineer, petroleum engineer, and water engineer. So uh, the future of biochemical engineering, a personal vision, which is uh, the future trend in biochemical engineering, I can say is related to uh, health. Yeah, because now health is very important, especially in this uh, COVID-19 pandemics. So we are more toward uh, personalized uh, medical, which is uh, novel diagnosis. Yeah, this is need to be fast. Second one is uh, environmental because you can see all this is caused by environmental issue so enhance environmental stability so make sure it's stable environmental and human can work, live together food young because the population is getting more and more with less land so more so future food and the food security issue is another problem that's why we can develop a future food uh, research center here in university also energy direct bio, um, biology future uh, fuel productions because in the past we are focused a lot with uh, solar wind focus in hydrogen now. I think the future direction should be in the biology example because photosynthesis will definitely produce a lot of energy. Right, I is a uh, bioengineer inform information storage. Yeah, in the past we are, we deal with a lot of hard disk. Yeah, we deal a lot, uh, recently we deal a lot of cloud system. So in future, definitely that is better to uh, energy storage. Just a recent one, I just share with you, uh, in, like example in the battery, in the future that battery is no longer using a, a, a a ceramic yeah to store battery yeah so in future definitely we are use something uh like example uh microalgae or seaweed can store battery we call it agarose right so you can see H E P F E I actually is something herb but it's a it's a it's a it's a country located in China so easy to remember H stand for health E stand for environmental F stand for food E stand for energy I stand for IP right so the future of buying uh chemical engineering can be uh. Uh, has the crucial uh, crucial loop deliver a uh, biotech and diverse uh, discovery and innovation for benefit of society. So you can say it's very important, and it is important to have a right combination at the right time at the right place. Right. So the skill graduate need for the future, I can say we let me let us recap for the industry one point oh, which we focus a lot by and uh, uh steam engine. That's why we have a uh, power equipment. Right. So second industry four point oh, which is uh. We have developed a conveyor, we have mass productions, we have machine. Industry 3.0, we have electrics, uh, electric equipment because we have technology of PLC and CNC. And the fourth industry 4.0, because we have a, uh, cyber and physical, that's why we come up with inter, uh, intellectual uh, design. In industry 5.0, actually, we should benefit to more people. Because that's why we have a uh, combining of uh, integrating of automation and additive manufacturing come with a mass custom estimation. That's why a lot of people can benefit from this uh, industry revolution. Right, so just a quick recap of industry 4.0 and 5.0, you can see this level. Right, in terms of labor, human or machine can work independently in industry 5.0, 4.0. Why industry 5.0, in uh, human and machine should work together. System, we focus on uh, crowd physical, while in this uh, industry 5.0, we focus on creative cyber physical. Well, for this uh, product and services, we focus on target group. That's why not many people 
benefit from the industry 4.0. But industry 5.0 is individ individually uh, personalized, which a, a lot of people can uh, benefit because it's mass customization. Also, supply chain, yeah, we focus on data analysis. Well, in this uh, industry 5.0, we're responsive and distributed. We can receive feedback immediately. And resulted uh, the networking industry, we have a lot of IoT connective uh, devices using Wi-Fi. But Energy 5.0 is more to greater uh, customer experience. Right. So in short, machine and human beings should work together in the future. So before I end my presentation, I would like to promote some of my new books. So starting from 2019, we have written a few books. We call it uh, By Our Process Engineering published in CRC. Second book, we are talking about liquid by system. We published in this in LCR in 2020. And this year, we focus a lot on industry 5.0. So the new book is at the prospect of industry 5.0 in biomanufacturing. So I believe this book is currently available in a lot of uh, online stores. Right. So we'd like to invite you to join uh, one of our conference which we organize in next year. So in Langkawi, hopefully this will be the physical conference because uh, uh, we have enough for this uh, online virtual conference. So hopefully this will be the physical conference. And for information, Langkawi country is open already, but I'm not sure it's whether it's safe or not. But the date for this uh, conference is six or, uh, to, uh, 4 to 6 August 2020. Right. So, as you know, I'm very active in this uh, editor board, coming editor board of this uh, general hazard material, core for paper, also bio resource technology, environmental pollution, chemosphere, environmental research, scientific report, bioengineer, and also processes. Yeah, I'm also editor in chief of this uh, current nutrient, nutrition, and food science. So, feel free to support and let me know if you're interested to join this conference, uh, this uh, paper. Right. So, this will be my last slide. So, I'm very responsive. You can email me, you can uh, you can text, uh, text me also. Yeah, this is my uh, line, this is my WeChat, this is my WhatsApp, and this is my Facebook uh, Messenger, and this is our website, uh, this is good website. So that's all from me. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you for the show, for very, uh, this presentation, and of course, the presentation will be a uh, uh, brilliant uh, student horizon and also is, uh, um, give them uh, inspiration. Okay, uh, everyone, uh, is there any questions? So you can uh, write your question on the chat box or directly mm -hmm. raise your hand and then ask to Professor Show. Okay. Yes, feel free to ask question if you have. <laughs> Okay, while, uh, while uh, waiting for uh, the other participants uh, ask for the question, um, I really wonder to know about the uh, LPS. The uh, LPS, the, uh, you uh, said that liquid uh, bypass system could, uh, do you think this uh, system could be applied for all strength of uh, microalgae? Because uh, as we know that uh, some might, uh, some of the challenges to uh, utilize the microalgae is the uh, harder. Uh, I mean, uh, the it is a bit hard for us to harvest and also to uh, extract the functional compound. What is the uh, benefit of using this uh, LPS, and whether this is uh, also compatible for all the strain of microalgae? Okay, thank you for the questions. Yeah, for information, uh, so far we have tried this using a uh, liquid biopsy system to do a lot of extraction, separation, and purifications. So uh, I can say uh, we, can, we are confident that uh, all types of microalgae is suitable for, you, so, for this uh, liquid biopsy system. Uh, so far, we don't encounter any problem uh, when using this uh, liquid biopsy system in, in uh, extraction of biotic compound from microalgae. So I think one of the, uh, there's a lot of benefit, yeah. The one of the benefit, I think, um, in, in my next uh, presentation, yeah, if you, yeah, I will share with you the ten benefit of using liquid biomass system. There's high efficiency, low interface tension, yeah. There is a uh, high water content. All oh, this is the one uh, a lot of benefit of using this liquid biomass system. Yeah, I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, uh, any other questions from uh, participants to join this uh, session? Okay. Okay, adik-adik, silahkan. Okay, uh, even you uh, can uh, uh, yeah, uh, therefore your question in Bahasa, I guess. No, don't worry. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I also understand Bahasa, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> we are neighbor country. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we yeah. understand each other. Okay, yeah. everyone? 
Okay. Oh. Yep. Izin. Ah, ya. Yeah. Uh, Zikri? Want to deliver in Bahasa or in English? Just feel free to ask directly your question to Professor Shou. Okay. Maybe I'll try in English. Okay, nice. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, Prof. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I'm curious about the video that you shown before. Uh, what method that you have uh, used uh, in that experiment? I mean, why the biomass uh, can separate in the in the maybe big less kimia gitu? Kenapa bisa berpisah seperti itu antara Uh, oil layer, water, and biomass, why they can be separate like that? Uh, and what's the method that you have been used? Okay, thank oh. you for the questions. Yeah, don't worry, I understand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so okay. so actually, uh, the, the method that we're using is uh, we call extractive technology, which is uh, we put the thermal separating uh, bio uh, core polymer inside the uh, cultivation system. So it's an EOPO, internet oxide, open oxide. So with that, uh, With that uh, thermal separating polymer, right, we heat it above the critical solution temperature, you will form two phases. So with the two phases form, right, you will, you will drag all this, uh, break the biomass uh, cell wall. At the same time, you can pull uh, the biomass to the bottom phase so you can recycle the biomass as well. So the, 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 the important rule is uh, EOPO, Italian oxide poplar oxide thermal separating in the cultivation system. Yeah, I hope I answer your question. Yes, thank you, Prof. Welcome. Okay, uh, Professor Chow, there's uh, another question from the chat box. Okay, uh, the question delivered from Agil. Uh, he asked about the, um, still last year, I've, I've seen many articles about using biomass for renewable energy sources, but uh, is it economically profitable? Okay, so thank you for the questions. Uh, Yeah, so just to be honest with you, right, actually, uh, until today, I don't think uh, the micro, uh, the, 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 the biomass for renewable energy is sustainable, is economy for, uh, feasible, because a lot of depends on the government subsidies, government support. So because it's a lot of in R&D, yeah, research and development stage, so we use a lot of uh, money, unless you, you, you have a big company to support, like uh, ExxonMobil, uh, Bretonas, all these big companies to support, and they, they, they are not care about the, the better profit level, then it's work. Yeah. So far, I, I can see uh, some of the company they are still in R&D stage, they find, that's why it's, so, it's not so economy uh, visible. Yeah, this is my honest opinion. Yeah, I hope I answer your question. Okay. Mm. Uh, thank you for uh, this. Um, I guess your answer uh, is a uh, bit to the uh, question that Agil uh, proposed today. Okay, any other questions? Or you can, uh, we still have uh, enough time for this question. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, adik-adik, silahkan. Adik-adik mahasiswa. Atau yang, uh, Bapak, Ibu, mau enggak? Silahkan jika ada yang mau ditanyakan. Okay, uh, Professor Shaw, regarding your yeah. answer related the uh, economical, uh, any, uh, economic, uh, uh, I mean, the uh, possibility of this microalgae to be uh, utilized as a uh, bioenergy alternative, in which, uh, in which um, platform this microalgae will uh, can be contributed to, uh, to um, I mean, to, um, to solve the problem related to the bioenergy itself? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, what I'm thinking, right, yeah, uh, a lot of uh, research has been done, yeah, especially for this uh, biojet fuel, because if you produce biodiesel, yeah, the value of biodiesel is very low, yeah, very low compared to uh, biojet fuel. So the only way to make uh, uh, microalgae uh, biofuel become uh, valuable, I think, is to produce biojet fuel. For, for this uh, aircraft, yeah, for this uh, aeroplane, because uh, the, the fuel produced for biojet fuel is more valuable compared to biodiesel. So that's why a lot of research, they need to focus in this biojet fuel in terms of this uh, 
uh, low cost uh, biofuel. So this is one of the technology that uh, need to be enhanced. Yeah. I see. And yeah. what is the, the most challenging uh, aspect that uh, made the, uh, this uh, microalgae sources couldn't be uh, uh, mean, uh, economically uh, <laughs> prospective to be yeah, for... I think, uh, I, yeah, I think the, the most challenging one actually is a technology, yeah. So I believe the strength, yeah, definitely people can do the genetic modifier on the strength, yeah, from different researchers of different countries. I think the technology one is not mature yet. It's not stable, not stable. Some of the technology is only can perform in lab, lab skill. Some of the technology, they are not, uh, not feasible in the large skill, not able to apply it in the large area. Yes, example, we have a cultivation system. We have the downstream, which is uh, attraction, purification, and also uh, transification. All this is a bottleneck, which has caused the process to be difficult to scale up. I see. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting because uh, yes. microalgae, yeah, yeah. Uh, even we also have uh, many, yeah, we are rich of these uh, bioresources. So, yeah. yeah, always interesting when uh, we are talking about microalgae and then how we are uh, empowering these uh, sources to, be, to uh, pr produce many uh, functional compounds. Yes. Oke, okay, uh, ya adik-adik mahasiswa masih ada yang mau ditanya kan? Oke, okay, any other questions? Any other questions? Oh. <laughs> Oke. Okay. No worry, ya. Yeah. Actually, they, they can, uh, I have shared my slide, ya. Yeah, you they can, ya. Uh, contact me anytime by email or by whatever channel that they want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or even they can type in the meeting chat. Yeah. I will try my best to answer it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. So uh, everyone, you still uh, can uh, discuss uh, this topic with uh, Professor Shaw uh, through uh, the uh, chat box or uh, kindly mm -hmm. email him directly because uh, he uh, openly to uh, respond all of your questions. Even yes. the... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. We can say that uh, many uh, role of uh, chemists can uh, make this um, yeah this uh, biotechnology become more and more uh, difficult because as a chemist we can contribute uh, more uh, more in this uh, area uh, even with uh, our um, by modif uh, conducting many modifications by uh, using uh, many uh, green chemicals or even for us uh, yeah genetic engineering even also can be uh, conduct to uh, yeah to enhance the properties of uh, microalgae to uh, produce the useful compound that we targeted yes. okay uh, any uh, Anything you want to uh, deliver just before the conversation? Yeah, I think no more. I think other speaker is waiting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for a very uh, yeah, interesting and uh, inspiring uh, presentation today. Hopefully, uh, all of these participants still can be connected and uh, email you for uh, anything that they want to ask. Okay. Okay. Uh, yep. okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Thank you for the show. And then uh, we will uh, give the next opportunity for uh, the second uh, speaker. Again, thank you for uh, support this program at all. Yeah, thank you so much for organizing it. Okay, uh, Bapak Ibu, kita akan masuk ke sesi berikutnya. Okay, uh, I guess. Um, Dr. Chu has already uh, joined this uh, session too. Okay. Right, yeah. Thanks a lot, Dr. Hadi. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I uh, will not uh, put my introduction, so please uh, feel free to introduce yourself and then yes. share no worries. <laughs> <laughs> so the other about uh, your research and also uh, the other thing that uh, I believe that will inspire the participant who already joined this uh, session. Again, thank you, Dr. Chu, for uh, joining this uh, general right, lecture yeah. series. Mm -hmm. right, thanks so much, Dr. Hadi. So, okay.
Let me share the screen first. Can you all see the main screen? Uh, yes. All right, thanks a lot. I'll just... Sorry. Sorry, I just give me one moment. Readjust this. All right, yeah, so thank you everyone for yeah, joining us in this session today. And thank you so much to Dr. Halley from Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia for the invitation uh, to Professor Shopala, uh, Dr. Abraf, Dr. Ku, as well as me for some, some, some of our research topic briefing. So I think uh, I also work under Professor Sho as he has already shown you just now, I'm part of the research group. So maybe our topic should be uh, quite about the same, but hopefully you can get some new insights, right? So my topic today will include on some of the microalgae biorefinery and the bioprocessors for multiple products attainment. So I'll try to keep it brief, right, uh, due to the time limitation. I'll just go briefly into what is microalgae, a bit on microalgae processing, the upstream and the downstream processes, biorefinery concept, multi-phase bioseparation processes, the new technology known as liquid triphasic partitioning and slightly on the bioreactor design with integration on automation and machine learning. Okay, so actually uh, I did my PhD from the University of Nottingham also under Professor Sho. And before that I was part of the food and pharmaceutical engineering research group also in Nottingham. Okay, I did just a brief uh, research uh, duration in Nanotechnology and Catalysis Research Center from the University of Malaya. And currently I'm a lecturer in the School of NG Energy and Chemical Engineering in Siaman University, Malaysia. So my area of interest is more towards the bioprocess designing for both upstream and downstream. This includes the microalgae cultivation or some form of plants, okay, agricultural, and how we can process them into valuable biomolecules. So I also work on biorefinery, new kinds of processes in order to improve the efficiency, renewable energy, as well as sustainable bioprocessing. Salman University is actually the first China university to have a branch campus. So it's quite new, about five years old, right? established in 2016. And one of the special thing is that we have an Olympic sized swimming pool, I think the only one in Malaysia to have this facility. So our campus is not very new, uh, not very old, okay? just five years old. And so we're still expanding as of current stage. If you do get the opportunity, I welcome you to come to Salmon University, Malaysia to have a look because the campus is very beautiful. And just slightly on our specialty, right? For the XMUM chemical engineering, we actually also have the simulated integrated process plan where we can actually simulate an actual process plan within the university itself. Right? So we can train our students on how they can manage and also look into processes, right? just from the computer and also on the basis of a real mini actual plant that is in the university grounds. Okay. So far, I have been an academic for just, I just started as a lecturer over two years ago. Right? So far I've published over 115 journal articles edited more than 10 book chapters and currently editing three books, also as promoted by Professor Sho, uh, our most recent book on liquid biophysics system, okay, their technology, their advantages and fundamentals, and also the prospects of industrial and biomanufacturing 5.0. So this one is one level ahead from the current IR 4.0, which is on automation. IR 5.0 is more to customization. So if you're interested in industrial processing as well as biomanufacturing, yeah, you can have a look. I'm co-supervising right, 11 postgraduate students and uh, I also have collaborators in various regions from Taiwan, Japan, China, India, Vietnam, New Zealand, UAE, UK, and I think we can add Dr. Halley in from Indonesia as well. So look forward to more collaborations with you. 
Uh, I'm serving as the editorial board member, guest editor and review editor in a few of these journals here. Right, so if you would like to look into the special issue, then you can also check them. Okay, so I actually prepared this introductory slide on microalgae and algae, but I think uh, you all should be, most of you should know what it is already. So I'll just briefly go through, right? Just in case you're not sure, algae and microalgae are actually those green colored things that you see on the surface right, of water surfaces. If you leave them stagnant, eventually you will see green colored things growing, right? And these are actually the microalgae. So there's two types. One is the more useful type and one is the harmful type. And if we were to scale in, right, look into a tele microscopic scale, then we can actually see that this is the structure of how algae looks like. Right? There are an agglomeration, a clump of all these cells. Right? But from what we, are, what we see okay, from just the normal view is actually in the powder form. This is the microscopic view. Okay, this is microalgae, and for the normal kind of algae, it's just known as the seaweed, right? which you're all familiar with. So there are actually various kinds of species of microalgae, in fact, more than 50,000. Right? So I think the question to Professor Shu is quite relevant, whether the technology can be used for different kinds of microalgae. Right? So we all understand that different kinds of microalgae, they have different structures, their cells, they can, upstand, they can withstand different kinds of capacity, they have different properties. So maybe each and every different kind of species will have some needs, okay, special needs on how they can be processed. And also different kinds of species have different kinds of composition. Right? Maybe for nitrogen content, they can range from 5.4 to 16.7, and some will have more proteins up to 55% while some have less, okay, maybe just 17.9. But the main three things that the microalgae contains is actually the lipids, proteins, as well as carbohydrate. Right? These are the three main contents, but their values can vary according to the type of species. So this table just shows us an example of a few species and their main composition. So what we work on for our research group is we work on some of the more common species, right? Cora vulgaris, Sorokiniana, and the spirulina strain. This is because we are more focused towards the lipid and the protein extraction. For spirulina, we work on the pigment extraction. So this pigment will have some antioxidant, some anti-inflammatory, which is very good as a nutritional supplement. And the good thing about using algae is that it just requires sunlight, okay, which is free source, carbon dioxide, which we can get from the industry, water, and minimal nutrients. Right, so all these three are actually easily available. And nutrients, because we only need in small amount, we can also potentially get it from waste. Right, this makes algae a very potential source and almost like a free kind of plants, right, which we can grow. And they will give us these three main compounds, carbohydrate, proteins, and oil, which we can further generate into various products. So why do we choose microalgae as the main renewable feedstock? Right? It's because compared to normal kinds of crops, right, maybe if you're growing vegetables, you're growing soybean, or if you're growing uh, some corn, okay, for this biofuel kind of crops, Actually, compared to them, algae will grow much faster. They only take about 10 to 12 days to fully mature. Okay. And the good thing is they consume a lot more carbon dioxide compared to the normal kind of plants. So this will also help to reduce the climate, climate environmental impact right, by reducing the carbon source in the atmosphere okay, and converting them into oxygen, similar to plants. Also, they can be used and made into more products, right? Compared to some normal kinds of crops, which you can only generate into one kind of product. For algae, you can use them for food, uh, fuel, and feed, right? These three are the main sources. And it has also been proven that algae can purify wastewater. Unlike the normal kind of crops that you grow on the ground, okay, algae is grown using water. So it's a kind of aquatic plant. So since it must be grown in water, it can also have the potential to be grown in wastewater, right? where we will, it will uptake all the nutrients and the contaminants from the wastewater and transform them as a part of the nutrient feed right? so in order to improve its productivity. Uh, currently, 
has mentioned, right, the biorefinery serves as the process for us to transform this very uh, microalgae biomass into various products. So instead of just taking algae as proteins or maybe just for fuel, we can have more than one products from one source. And also compared to the traditional crops, it has higher biofuel yield. It does not compete with agriculture because it requires less land to cultivate. It can be grown in the sea and there is a lot of sea land available compared to the normal land which people need to maybe for development or other purposes. And it has also been proven that the algae biomass, the lipid from algae is uh, potentially fit okay, and suitable to be used for biofuel production, bioelectricity and bioenergy. Right? And so far, some of the industries uh, overseas, they're uptaking this technology. So it's going to create a new field where people are going to implement the okay, algae either for wastewater or for energy generation. So it can be used in industrial for aquaculture, animal feed, biofertilizer, pharmaceuticals, for commercial application, nutritional products creation, cosmetics, biochemicals, as well as proteins production, for fine chemicals that will include the very expensive kind of carotenoids, fatty acids, and also bioactive compounds, right? more for pharmaceutical application, and also for drug screening, because certain species of microalgae contains antimicrobial, antiviral, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer, uh, anti-obesity, right? and uh, so on. Now, the main part about microalgae is uh, comprised under two sections. One is the upstream processing and one is the downstream processing. Right. In upstream processing, it will include everything from growing the algae, right, from the tiny cells into the fully matured algae. Right. That's one portion. And everything else from the processing section, okay, transforming this algae into lipids, proteins, or carbohydrate is considered as the downstream processing. Right. So we divide it into two. And if I were to put it in another scenario, the upstream will be like growing the crops. Right? So let's say I can plant the soybean and upstream is watching the soybean grow from seeds to the full soybean. Then downstream is how I extract right, proteins from the soybean right, or the soil milk, right? That's to the final product. Same thing for algae that includes the upstream and the downstream processing. In upstream of the microalgae cultivation, there are actually various processes right, and various kinds of equipments which we can use. That includes the flat panel photobioreactor, PBR, horizontal tubular PBR, bubble column PBR, helical type, as well as the open pond system. So different kind of researches have been done to evaluate the efficiency of all different kinds of PBR. This PBR, uh, comprised of the closed system for cultivation. That means everything is within an equipment. And for the open pond system, then it's being grown as, uh, as you can see here. It's being grown outside and this is open to the atmosphere. Whereas for this case, it is all within a closed system. Both have their advantages and their disadvantages. Right? Mainly for the closed system, usually they can get a higher growth rate but then the system will require more energy and they'll require more nutrient supply, okay, as well as the need for aeration. And there are some other considerations like the capital cost, because all these designs, they require some form of checking. Okay, they need to be developed well and there should be sufficient light penetration. So there'll be more energy, but more energy needed, but there'll be higher productivity. Whereas for the open pond system, we can just leave it out here and then this will be the, the flow of them will be done by this water pedal here, which will help to aerate the system. But the drawback of the open pond system is that uh, it can be contaminated easily. Right? So anything from outside can drop into the pond. They will maybe bring in some bacteria and then poison the system. So this has its advantages as well as its advantages. And the productivity for open pond system is actually not as high compared to the coast system. Okay, so now I'll go into the microalgae processing, which is actually one of the main focus. So let's take an example of a photobioreactor. Okay, if we insert the algae inside, the algae requires a source of sunlight and it will require a carbon dioxide feed, okay, which it will convert into oxygen and energy. 
And where do we get this carbon dioxide is we can usually take it as a source from the industry. Several of these uh, industrial processes, when they are manufacturing any products, they tend to produce a lot of this waste gas, right? They can include carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, or any of the poisonous gas. So instead of letting this gas out from the atmosphere, right, we can collect them, right, maybe through the, the outlet and channel them into a photobioreactor system. Same thing for the waste heat and the wastewater from the industry. We can also channel them into a closed system and we add the algae in in order to cultivate them. Okay, so this algae will convert all this into oxygen and the biomass, which will then be further harvested and processed into various products that includes the bio oil, the lipids for biodiesel, bio jet fuel, as well as other valuable products like the nutraceuticals, fertilizers, nutritional supplements, that includes the protein and the carbohydrate portion. But the real question is how we are going to process this microalgae into various products in a simple and efficient designed manner. So far, there are various kinds of downstream processes that have already been done to extract these four main compounds from algae. That includes lipid, proteins, carbohydrate, and the pigments. So people have tried the ultrasound assisted extraction. They will put algae into an ultrasound system and the ultrasound waves, right, and they, uh, they will create these cavitation effects which will break the cell. When the cell is broken, then all these biomolecules will be released. People have also tried microwave, right, which also the wave will disrupt the cell and break it for release of the biomolecules. Pulse electric field, also using the, just a low voltage power in order to break the cells. Current technologies include uh, membrane filtration, cross-flow cross filtration. This two, they use it to uh, pump the algae okay, towards the membrane and this centrifugal force, as well as the reverse osmosis process will actually help to break the cell and also extract out the biomolecules. And one of the recent technology is the supercritical fluid extraction in order to extract out these biomolecules in a supercritical condition. Right. But this, although it's very efficient, it's actually very expensive to generate this supercritical condition, which means that the final product will be very expensive due to the operating cost. This is just an illustration of the original microalgae cell and the cell that has been disrupted right, through any of the processes. Then once it is disrupted, it will break and release all these biomolecules, right, which we will use in the subsequent processing. Okay, the interesting thing about biorefinery system is uh, unlike usual kinds of uh, ordinary systems, right? also um, analogous means like same to what we see in a petroleum refinery. We have just one biomass, which is the microalgae, and through different processes, we can get more than one compound. Right? Also in the petroleum refinery, they just take crude oil and then they're processed into various kinds of product, right? that's ranging from petroleum fuel, biodiesel, right, jet fuel, then they will go to some of the soaps products right, and so on. They try to utilize the raw material as much as they can and produce as many things as possible. So same thing for microalgae biorefinery. We will use microalgae as the biomass to produce as many products as we can. That includes the fuel, chemical products, and also biomaterials in order to improve its cost efficiency. So here we have an example. Let's say I have the aquatic biomass, right? This microalgae, and just adding sunlight, carbon dioxide, and nutrients, right? So I will have three fractions. One is the oil fraction, the lipids, the protein fraction, and the carbohydrate fraction. So let's say from the oil fraction, right? I can extract the oil and through oleochemical processes, right, or transesterification, I can get uh, value-added products as well as biodiesel. Then from the protein fraction. I can use it as animal feed, right? And then I can use it as uh, value added products for nutritional supplements. And for the carbohydrate section of the microalgae undergoing fermentation, I can convert it into ethanol, or butanol, which are part of the bioenergy. And also algae contains maybe just a small fraction of other kinds of minerals like pigments, carotenoids, right? And all this can be added into value added products which includes 
uh, nutritional supplements or drugs, right? Drugs delivery uh, in terms of medicines. So here are just a few applications, right? That we can all get from just one source of microalgae. It can be used for uh, yeah, nutritional supplements, right? Medicines to combat different kinds of infection, diseases. The natural pigments are useful as a food ingredients, functional food ingredients. That means it will have its health benefits along with the usual benefits of food products. Biofuels, bioenergy, fertilizer from the span algae biomass, high value biomolecules that includes chlorophyll, phycocyanin, the pigments, and some form of fatty acids, right, which are all very useful. Very rare, but some algae do have anti-cancer and anti-tumor ability. So this can also be converted into supplements, right, which can help to either reduce the effects of this cancer and tumor or else to prevent them altogether. And also recently people have been using algae as part of the chemical industry for the production of bioplastics and VOC, right, volatile organic compounds. The conventional microalgae biorefinery process will start from the cultivation, then undergoing the centrifugation, followed by drying of the biomass, then pre-treatment to break the cell before we can extract the product. Right? But you can see that this will take up to like five steps before we eventually get the final product for purification. And this is actually quite long. So with the introduction of the liquid bioseparation system, we can actually skip all these three steps here by just moving from the cultivation to the final extraction process. And this liquid uh, biphasic technology or liquid triphasic, all part of the liquid bioseparation system is uh, actually very useful because it can, it will reduce all the additional steps. Right? So it's actually a very simple processing. We just take the raw algae biomass, put into the system, then we can even uh, generate this processing using wet biomass. So instead of using the conventional biorefinery, it's an environmental friendly process because all these chemicals that are used in the system can actually be recycled. Right? For subsequent processing, this will save the cost of the raw material, okay, as written here. And the good thing about this liquid bio separation is that we can add them with assisted technologies like ultrasound, electropermeabilization, microwave processes, as maybe homogenization, and different kinds of additional pretreatment, right, in order to improve the efficiency of the overall separation. Okay, and this process was invented in order to counter the current difficulties in the conventional extraction process, right, which includes high costs, long processing, and a lot of steps required before we can get the final product. Okay, so I'll just show you a few examples of how this system works. Right? So currently we have liquid biphasic two phase with the word bi here and liquid triphasic, right? Three phase with the word tri here. Right? So two phase and three phase. And we have tested with the addition of ultrasonication, ultrasound, microwave, homogenization, as well as free storing in order to assist the overall process. This liquid biphasic or triphasic system is very simple because it just utilizes simple two-phase system with the addition of the pretreatment in order to separate the biomolecules into two necessary phase, which means that, as you can see here, all these systems contain either two or three phases, right? And when there is this system where we add from, okay, let's say we have the original, just one mixture of proteins and some contaminants. Right, so from this system, I will add in one of the suitable solvent in order to make sure that we can create two phases. So we will select the appropriate salt phase and the alcohol phase, which are immiscible. And from there, the desired protein molecules will actually have the, uh, the liking okay, to only the top phase and they will all go to the top phase. So let's say for this system, I just want the brown color part here and the white color part will contain the contaminants of the system. So in uh, what I can emphasize for this system is the selection of the alcohol and the salt phase, or in other words, top and bottom must be selected well so that we can successfully separate what we want to the desired phase. Right? Then from there, we can just take the top phase 
uh, which will contain what we want. And the bottom phase can either be recycled or it can be further processed using the content that is available inside. And recently we have came up with the liquid triphasic partitioning system. Right? So instead of the two phases, this liquid triphasic has three phases. And in each of this phase here, the top, the middle and the bottom, they contain a higher percentage of one specific biomolecule. For example, the top phase here can contain uh, maybe over 90% of the lipid. The middle will contain more than 90% of the protein and the bottom will contain more than 90% of the carbohydrate. This means that if, if I don't use this system, I will get one solution containing lipid, protein and carbohydrate. Right. But let's say if I want to make into a protein supplement, I do not need the lipid and carbohydrate, I just need the protein. Right. So through this system, I can just separate out the middle portion and use it for protein supplement, whereas the top phase, lipid and carbohydrate, I can use it for another purpose, maybe for biofuel and for bioenergy. Right. And when I do this, right, that means separating one mixture into several products, this will, be, uh, this will constitute as the biorefinery which means that not only can I generate more than one product, so I will be able to generate more profit from the entire process. And yeah, similar to liquid by basic, the process is very simple. The addition of the appropriate solvent mixtures as well as the phase component, it is inexpensive as the materials can be recycled and easily scalable. So we can go from a simple 100 ml system from the lab scale to a 10 liter system Okay, for the pilot running and then further on to a 50 liter system. In this processing, there are of course several factors which will affect the uh, efficiency of the products that we will get. So we can adjust the type of solvent, the combination of the phase component, the pH of the system, depending on the type of microalgae, uh, the addition of air flotation time. So maybe not necessarily longer time will give a better product, but we need some sufficient air flow rate, right? Before we can separate out the two phases, the crude extract concentration, concentration of top and bottom, rotation rate, volume ratio, solvent ratio, intensity and amplitude, uh, depending on the kind of pretreatment, maybe for microwave, it's how much power we use, how long is the duration that we use, the temperature, as proteins are quite sensitive to high temperatures, so during the processing, we must make sure it does not exceed a certain amount, right? otherwise the proteins will degrade. And once we have adjusted all this, we will try to uh, choose the conditions that give us the maximal recovery right, through analysis. So here are just a few examples of where the system has been used. Right? This blue color is for phycocyanin from spirulina, this three-phase system of proteins, lipid, and carbohydrate from chlorella. And this is estazentin, a red pigment from Haematococcus pulvalis. Okay. Uh, recently, right, uh, our research group is working on this bioreactor design, which uh, serves as this simultaneous upstream and the downstream cultivation. So the upstream part is the growing of the microalgae on the left side. And on the right side here is the downstream processing in order to use the two-phase system to separate out more than one biomolecule. At the same time, because we want to reduce the need for labor, that means we don't need to put someone there to monitor the system. We're implementing this um, IoT, okay, Internet of Things, and also the automation system uh, for this novel design, right? which means that we add this, some sensors, pH sensors, temperature sensor, level sensor, Right, which will all collect data, and this will be collected at any time. Right? It'll be running continuously. The data will be sent to one of the database system, which we can then monitor from the smartphone, meaning that uh, the student okay, or the researcher running this system, they can still monitor what is the temperature, how is the growth growing, right? even though they are not present on the site. Okay? They can do it from at home or they can do it anytime. At the same time, this novel automation system is very useful because let's say if the water level drops below a certain limit right, or threshold, then the system will give us a warning saying that something is wrong with the water. Then we will send someone to go here and check out the system. Either they need to adjust the water level, adjust the temperature, 
or adjust the pH depending on what is the reading from the sensor. So this is, I think, is some of the kind of uprising technique, not just for microalgae cultivation, also in agricultural, they are tending to use some of this system, right? So that they can measure the different intensity of the sunlight, the water contents, right, from the soil, as well as the composition. This will be the implementation of IoT towards the continuous cultivation system. So what I can propose as the way to move forward from this is algae, because algae is an uprising and renewable source, right, which we can produce various byproducts. The main thing to do now is how we can improve the cost effectiveness right, of the overall algae processing. And once we create more and more novel techniques, which are more efficient and can fully utilize the ability of algae, then we can generate more products which means that we'll be able to improve the overall cost as well as to generate byproducts. The second is how we can improve the existing biorefinery processes in order to generate more than one products, including the proteins, lipid, carbohydrate, and even pigments, right? so that we can generate more profit and make this a feasible process. Okay, the advanced biorefinery with automation, right? this will indirectly reduce the need of labor, that means we don't have to put people there to monitor and everything can be controlled in a precise manner. Also, if we can promote the algae resources, meaning that we can interchange some of the existing kinds of supplements. So currently maybe for protein nutritional supplements, they use the usual traditional crops. If we can promote to people that algae is a new source and their proteins is comparable, to the existing products, then people are, should be willing to shift right, towards, instead of using the conventional crops, which are also being challenged by the food security problem, so they can convert the raw materials from the existing crops towards algae. Okay, and to encourage more adaptation of algae as a renewable source, right, because algae is very potential, it can be grown easily, and it's considered as a sustainable source. Right, which we should all try to implement for improving the environmental impacts and also the overall cost effectiveness. And yeah, these are several of the SDGs that are covered within the research scope. That includes SDG 3 for good health, well-being, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, sustainable cities, as well as to protect the life below water. Uh, okay, so I would also like to thank the Bioseparation Research Group who has contributed greatly to all my achievements and I'm very happy to work with them under this project. Yeah, thank you so much everyone for your kind attention and yeah, if you have any proposal or any topics that you would like to discuss further, feel free to email me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chiu, for a very uh, uh, interesting topic. Uh, Thanks, <laughs> Let's invite a uh, participant who wants to ask some questions. Okay, uh, everyone, is there any questions regarding the uh, topic that has been presented by Dr. Chiu? Oh, saya ada pertanyaan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, Dr. Chu, is there any method on how to choose the best nutrition for microalgae so that we can get certain substance, for instance, the lipid in large quantities? Thank you. In large quantities? Uh, okay, so I understand your question because microalgae has three compounds, right? So maybe you just want to get more lipid, but you don't want the proteins and you don't want the carbohydrate. So yeah, this liquid biphasic system, right, then we can choose the correct solvent so that only the lipid goes to the top base. That means that you will not have proteins and you will not have carbohydrate. Then you can extract the top base and get what you want. The second option is when, if you only want lipid, then you have to choose the microalgae that has the most lipid. So a microalgae that has more percentage, then you can choose that so that maybe it has 50%, then less proteins and carbohydrate. Thank you so much, Dr. Chu. Okay, thank you. Okay, it is uh, 
another question. Okay, let me uh, check the chat box and then first uh, another question from Putri. Okay, what has amazed you that the most about the application of microalgae that you have studied? Oh, yeah, thanks Putri for the question. I think this is a very inspiring question. Okay, so when I when I first heard about microalgae, so I'm also not sure what it is. Right? Then uh, I was introduced by the research group, then they taught me how to cultivate. And as I did more and more research, I found that this microalgae is actually very useful because I've tested it in growing in wastewater and it has proven that the contaminants, let's say the nitrogen phosphorus from the wastewater has been reduced. So this proves that microalgae eats up all these unwanted nutrients. At the same time, I have successfully get lipids, proteins, and carbohydrates from the same source. Right? So in general, I can say that it's one of the super crops where it can start from wastewater growing to the final product. And after I get everything, I put it back into the ground for fertilizer. So it really completes a whole life cycle yeah, as a super crop. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, still there's some questions <laughs> in yeah, the chat. Yeah. Uh, let me read, right? Okay, Thanks. thank you. Thanks, Mr. Sifatu. Uh, okay, this uh, question on how we can manage the algae waste. Yes, yeah, because uh, after I extract the lipids, proteins, and carbohydrate, right, so I will have the spent biomass waste and instead of just throwing it to the rubbish bin then I can use this waste uh, sometimes we can pyrolyze it pyrolysis convert it into biochar and then we can use it as fertilizer I know the content is not as much as normal fresh algae but it's better than throwing it away or else you don't have to pyrolyze it you can just put it in the soil it will still have some nutrients I think it's very good not to waste them Okay, thanks, Lilies. Uh, you want to ask about the PBR? Does algae treatment process? Does the algae treatment process with PBR produce waste? If it is produced, how is the waste treatment? Because earlier we said that this process is more environmental friendly. Uh, is the algae treatment? Uh, okay, I'm not sure if you're talking about the simultaneous system. Uh, wait, let me see. You are talking about algae treatment process. Uh, oh, if you're talking about the waste treatment, right? Yeah, so let's say if I were to replace the commercial medium in the PBR with waste medium, okay, then after I cultivate microalgae, the algae grows, I harvest the algae, yes, I will still have wastewater, okay, and the microalgae will not consume everything. So we will have uh, the same waste, but we will have less of it, meaning that it can act as a um, primary filter for the wastewater, then we will proceed to secondary filter. It's uh, microalgae cannot consume, com cannot completely purify your water, but it can reduce some of the hazardous content so that we can proceed to the second step. And this actually helps to, I would say, naturally purify a portion of it. Yeah, so it's still free compared to normal processing. Okay, thanks a lot, Anissa. Okay, thanks a lot, Moza. You want to ask that previously mentioned they are harmful and useful algae. Are there any special characteristics to different uh, shade this time? Okay, by, uh, by harmful and uh, useful algae, it's not that we will know once we view, view the algae species, right? So you need to do the proper characterization. You need to understand which, which species is involved. Then only from there you can see uh, whether they are the good types or the bad types. Some of the bad type of algae is because um, they like to come together, they grow too fast. So when they grow on top of the lake, then they will block the sunlight, they will eat too much carbon dioxide and the fishes within will die. Okay, that one is the bad kind. The good kinds are those that uh, if you can create them yourselves, right, so that you can extract what you want, then you can control them. Okay, thanks, Jana. Thank you so much for all the questions. Okay, <laughs> so many questions come up. Uh, I guess uh, <laughs> by time, every uh, participant will have more and more uh, questions. Okay. Right. Uh, Thank you so much, everyone. 
<laughs> Thank you everyone for the questions. Is there any uh, one questions for uh, the chin? Yeah, feel free to ask. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Thanks, Misty. Mm. I previously mentioned that microalgae can grow in wastewater and at the same time can treat wastewater. Regarding the wastewater process, how can microalgae act for wastewater treatment? Uh, microalgae, when they're growing, they also need minimal nutrients. Right? So in depending on the wastewater, right? so let's say so far we have tested with uh, pome, palm oil, meal, palm oil meal effluent wastewater, and we've also tested some of the sewage wastewater. So this wastewater will contain some of the chemicals which are suitable to grow microalgae. So as I said, microalgae will eat only what they want, but they will not eat the others. But still, it will eat one portion of the algae, maybe reduce some of the coloring, the content, then the final outcome will be a cleaner water, but still needs processing. I call that a natural bioremediation method. Does that answer your question? It's <laughs> very <laughs> answer the question. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Chu, thank you for the presentation. Uh, yes, I mean, there is still many questions come up from uh, <laughs> participants, but uh, unfortunately, <laughs> we are really good at time, and then uh, we still also have two uh, other speakers. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Ali. Again, thank you so much for your uh, presentation today. And then, uh, we thanks will... everyone. Yep. Yep. Thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you. Let's uh, continue uh, this uh, session by inviting um, the third speaker for uh, today general lectures. <laughs> I will invite uh, Dr. Afrak here. Hello, can you hear me? Mm, yeah, yes, I can hear you clearly. Uh, let me try to share my screen. Okay, can you see the screen? Ah, uh, yes, I can see. Right. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon to all the viewers that are watching this lecture. Uh, my name is Aparov Koyende, and today I'm going to talk about biorefinery of chlorella species using integrated multiphasic systems for biofuel, feed, and wound healing applications. So just a general information about me, I completed my master in engineering in chemical engineering from University of Nottingham in 2017. And I worked as a business development executive for a company called Vision Earth Care Private Limited, which majorly dealt with wastewater treatment. I was also able to procure a government tender during my, during my work worth around 7.5 million USD for 2.5 million liters per day sewage treatment at a facility in my state Maharashtra in India. After that, I joined University of Nottingham as a PhD student under Professor Sho, and I have been research assistant at University of Nottingham since then. I have published around seven first author articles and 20 articles in total in high impact factor journals. And very recently, I've also opened a YouTube channel called PhD Clinicus. So this channel is usually uh, meant for all the PhD students who are actually struggling with their research and how we can motivate them. So if you want to check out, you can scan the QR code that I have, that I have given here. Mm, yeah. If someone wants to scan, you can scan right now. I will wait for maybe five more seconds. All right, moving on. Uh, so about my research. My research basically is based on downstream processing of microalgae and also optimizing the extraction techniques. So just now we heard from Dr. Chu about uh, two-phase liquid 
systems and three-phase systems and how we utilize it for extraction of different biomolecules from microalgae. As a general knowledge that we already have heard from both the speakers before, algae is a photosynthetic plant. It grows in presence of carbon dioxide, sunlight, and water, and it ranges from unicellular to multicellular, which around size of 0.5 micrometers to 100 meters. And they also secrete carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids as a major component, and some secondary metabolites of vitamins, minerals, pigments, and polyunsaturated fatty acids. So what's the problem with microalgae? Sounds very, very good, but when the microalgae culture is grown, it only has around four to five percent of dry cell mass. The remaining 95 percent is water. It also has a very rigid cell wall, so which has to be disrupted for all the biomolecules inside the cell to be released outside. And the extraction of these biomolecules by conventional methods is very, very expensive and time consuming. Therefore, I tried to study a different extraction method, which is called liquid biphasic flotation system, which is a combination of the aqueous two-phase system and solvent sublation. And the second study that I conducted was on liquid triphasic flotation system. It's a combination of three-phase partitioning and solvent sublation. The major, uh, this, this process actually incorporates salting out effect by which the unwanted products are in one of the phase and the one that we want move to the second phase. So the liquid biphasic flotation system is addition of flotation or solvent sublation to the liquid liquid system that is aqueous two phase system. And it is mostly driven by phase separation that is done by either salt and alcohol or salt and ionic liquids or polymers such as PEG and salt. The main objectives of these studies were two-phase sugaring out system for extraction of proteins, three-phase flotation systems to extract proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates, and application of the extraction extracted proteins as a wound healing agent. Moving on to the optimization of protein extraction from chlorella vulgaris, by sugaring out assisted liquid biphasic electric flotation system. So just a rough background about this study. Uh, Sankaran et al. actually conducted a sugaring out method by utilizing ultrasonication. And the resultant protein extracted by this system after optimization was close to 93%. This value has to be taken into consideration because I will come back to it. So the main objective of this study was to extract the proteins by the sugaring out method and also try to optimize all the parameters and compare what was the optimum result with the control studies. This was how my study looked like. And similar to the study that was conducted before, I utilized electric flotation. So the electric electrolysis that was conducted by these by this, uh, graphite rods electrodes actually enables the cell disruption for microalgae cell. The parameters that I manipulated in these studies were the microalgae biomass loading, the, the voltage supply through the electrodes, the position of the electrodes in the phases, the concentration of the sugar, the types of sugar that were used, the acetonitrile, that's the top phase concentration, the flotation flow rate and the flotation time. And as this system utilized one factor at a time, these were the initial parameters kept. And as we can see in the results, that once I started with microalgae biomass loading, the highest percentage of protein recovery was obtained at microalgae biomass loading of 0.05 grams. And as I moved on to the next parameters, the protein recovery started to increase. So I could see that my optimization is working. The percentage of protein at the end of the study was noted as close to 
70%. Yeah, so as you can see, the LBEF system, the, the protein recovery was 69.66%. Compared to the control study without the cell disruption of electrolysis, it was noted at around 50%. Comparison with the small scale and large scale of 10 times yielded that the result were still similar once we move on to a higher scale system. The results of this study was the optimized parameters were 0.05 gram of microalgae biomass with 15 volt of DC current supply and the tip of the electrode was at bottom face. Glucose as the sugar with concentration of 300 grams per liter and acetonitrile with 100% concentration and air flow rate of 150 ml per minute and the flotation time was just 15 minutes. The protein recovered was 70%. And the major drawback that was seen was the electric current of zero to 30 volt that was used in this system was very low. Because as compared to the previous study that I mentioned, who got the result of 93% and I got somewhere around 70. So you can see that the maximum voltage of 30 volt that was used was not enough. The best way to optimize this is either improve the cell disruption or extract multiple products that can compensate for this low yield. After doing some literature review, I understood that current biorefinery routes that utilize a cascade approach, that is extraction of one component after the other, are very, very energy consuming. And they also have a lot of process units. Therefore, to do microalgae biorefinery, I had to extract oil fraction, that is the lipids, the protein fraction, the carbohydrate fraction at a, at a simultaneous instance. Therefore, the next study focused on biorefinery of chlorella sarokiniana using ultrasonication liquid triphasic flotation system. The liquid triphasic flotation system usually has three phases. So the top phase has the most amount of lipids. The bottom phase has most amount of carbohydrates. And the middle phase has mostly proteins. And after the extraction is done, this is how the system looks like. So as you can see, the top one is quite green. This one, after we extract and purify, we will get lipids. The middle phase has mostly proteins and also residual waste that can be separated out after purification. And the bottom phase has carbohydrates. The LTF system, the liquid triphasic flotation system, looks something like this at a smaller scale. The ultrasonication was added for cell disruption. To give a background of this study, Kitwain, Chu et al. Uh, actually conducted a study on protein extraction by three-phase partitioning without flotation system and the protein yield was close to 57%. After introducing flotation to the system, the protein yield increased to 87%. So the main aim of this study was to test out if I can get different biomolecules from other phases. The main objective of this study was to extract proteins and lipids at this point of time from these two phases and optimize the parameters and compare if I can recycle this phase. The parameters that were involved for this study were by microalgae biomass loading, concentration of salt, volume ratio of the salt and the butanol that was used as a top phase, ultrasonication duty, flotation flow rate, and flotation time. And as one factor at a time approach was utilized, the initial parameters were as And when I did the experiment and I moved on with the next uh, parameters, I could see that there was an increasing trend of protein recovery and the lipid recovery. The initial protein recovery was noted at somewhere around 90%. And the initial lipid recovery was somewhere around 30%. But as I moved on to do the optimization studies, I could see that the protein recovery was very, very close to 100%. And the lipid recovery 
increased to about 70%. The comparison studies were made between just the LTF without ultrasonication and without flotation as well. And as you can see that the proteins recovered actually reduced without the introduction of flotation and the ultrasonication. Same goes for the lipid recovery. The recycling of the top phase, that is the alcohol, was also done. And with further recycling stages, it was noticed that the protein recovery and the lipid recovery started to lower down. The results of these studies were microalgae biomass loading of 0.5%, the salt concentration of 40%, the volume ratio of 1 is to 1.5, ultrasonication settings were at 20 seconds on and 20 seconds off with 20% amplitude for five minutes. The flotation flow rate was 100 millimeter, milliliters per minute and the time of 15 minutes only. The proteins that were recovered were 97% and the lipids were 70%. So with the current ULTF system that was proposed, extraction of two components was actually possible. But there was one more phase. So I think the third phase should also have some biomolecule as well. So we move on to the next study to search whether there is a possibility of having a biorefinery from this system. The next study actually focused on biorefinery and extracting out all the three main biomolecules. It was to extract proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates simultaneously by this system and optimize the parameters of this system. The recycling liability of this, this system was also studied. Similar to the previous study, this time around the parameters were less. We only studied on the salt concentration, the volume ratio, flow rate, flotation duration, the ultrasonication duty, and the pH. And as the optimization studies went on, I could see that the recovery of all the three biomolecules started to increase. The protein recovery, the lipid recovery, and the carbohydrate recovery were around 80% and 40%. But as we moved on with the optimization studies, I could see that all the three recoveries of these components started to increase. With the last study of pH manipulation yielding the highest result of protein recovery at around 100%, lipid recovery at around 60%, and carbohydrate recovery at around 55%. The large scale of this study was also conducted of 15 times, and the recoveries of both the three components were very similar compared to the lowest scale. Recycling of the top phase that is alcohol, as well as the salt was done in this study as well. And it was noted that although the recovery started to decrease, there are multiple pathways by which we can substitute the alcohol and the salt without needing to utilize fresh material every single time. The results of this study was salt concentration of 40%, volume ratio of one is to one, flow rate of 100 ml per minute at five minutes of flotation time. The ultrasonication settings were 20 seconds on and 30 seconds off with pH of 6.5. The protein recovery was 97%, lipid recovery of 61%, and carbohydrate recovery of 52%. Now from this study, it was seen that the extraction of three biomolecules is still possible, but the main important thing to do is how can we apply? So the application of the extracted components is very, very necessary. This is where the next study came in, wherein I tried to in vitro evaluate the proteins extracted from the chlorella vulgaris, which were coated on a gelatin glutaraldehyde membrane and its wound healing applications were tested on. The largest organ of our human body is the skin, and an adult has usually 
kg of skin that stretches to two square kilometers, two square meters. And the excessive generation of reactive oxidant species disrupt the DNA and oxidizes the lipids and the proteins, which actually results in cell lysis that delays the wound healing. So whenever we get a cut, it takes longer time for the, the skin to heal. Therefore, in this study, I try to examine the proliferation of microalgae protein adsorbed on the gelatin GKA membrane. The adhesion capacity of these cells on the membrane was also studied and the wound healing rate of the proteins on scratched ACAD cells. The biocompatibility of the membrane was also studied on ACAD cells and the highest proliferation for one day test was noted at um, the cell with only protein. And as we moved on with the number of higher number of days at three day and seven day, the highest proliferation was noticed at the membrane with 1000 microgram of the purified proteins. The cell addition study was also conducted and it was noticed that the highest fluorescence of the cells, the viable cells was noticed at the figure D, which was 1000 micrograms of protein on the gelatin membrane and the control cells. The wound scratch study was also done on this test, wherein I tried to make a small scratch in my cell plate. And at 12 hours and 24 hours, pictures were taken with different concentration of proteins and the membrane. And it was noticed that at 1000 micrograms of proteins, the, the, the wound closure of the cell plate was quicker compared to the control. The results of this study was at one day, uh, the biocompatibility was around 76%. At three days, the biocompatibility was 80%. And at seven days, it was 90%. The highest viable cells were noticed at 10 GGP, that is 1000 micrograms of protein. And the highest wound closure was also noticed at the same setting of 82%. Conclusion of this study was, that integration of simultaneous cell disruption and extraction does ensure that we get high yields of all the biomolecules. Recycling of phases provides a circular approach for the system, and it will also reduce the cost. Ultrasonication assisted liquid triphasic flotation system is a very efficient approach to achieve biomolecular refinery. And the purified proteins from this system have the potential to enhance wound healing of the human skin cells. The future research has to be on studying the thermodynamic of this ULDF system and understand the phase separation that happens during this process. This will be helpful in increasing the scale of the experiment and go at a larger scale, which will be very beneficial for the industry. Further studies also need to be conducted to op optimize the recycling approach and purification of all the three components should be done to explore the application of all these biomolecules. These were the publications that actually resulted from this study. Hi everyone, my name is Afro Oyente. I'm a PhD student under supervision of Professor Paolo Show. My research is focused on downstream processing and biorefinery of microalgae. Microalgae is a unicellular organism that photosynthesizes with atmospheric carbon dioxide and grows exponentially with nutrient, water, and sunlight to secrete various bioactive molecules like protein, fats, carbs, vitamins, minerals, and polyunsaturated fatty acids. However, to recover these biomolecules from microalgae, complex techniques are used, which are mostly expensive, time consuming, and have a lot of unique processes. That's why, in the current market, only high profit products are extracted from microalgae, such as vitamins, minerals. My research explored a solution to tackle these issues. 
I am working on the extraction of multiple biomolecules in a multiphasic system named liquid triphasic rotation system, or in short, LTF. A pretreatment step of ultrasound is combined with this setup. Main principle of LTF is separation of three phases with mixture of alcohol, salt, and microalgae biomass. Proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates are extracted in different phases. Secretion of ultrasound and flotation enhances the yield of these compounds. One of the remarkable features is the quick extraction of these compounds, which is usually done in 10 to 15 minutes. I also studied application of extracted proteins on wound healing of human skin cells. The micro derived protein and salt. On gelatin glutaraldehyde accelerated the wound closure. I hope the research will contribute in providing better sustainable future for the Yeah, and you can contact me by my email or LinkedIn or research kit. I will I'm always available. And if you have any queries, you can always send me an email. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Haley, for inviting me to this conference. And I think I'm open to questions now. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Opera. It's a really nice uh, and interesting <laughs> presentation. So I can say that you have this uh, channel of your video. You can also share <laughs> with us your channel here, and then we can follow your uh, your uh, yeah, your video, which is explain about microalgae. Okay. Uh, now uh, again, thank you for the presentation. Now we come up to the uh, discussion session. There is one question come from the chat box. Okay. Okay. First question from uh, Yustika. Okay. Previously mentioned that microalgae can be used as wound healing agent. Can microalgae be applied in the form of composite wound dressing with additional material in the form of hydrogel? Uh, yeah, thank, thank you, Dr. Haley. Uh, thank you, Sika, for the question. Um, actually, it is very, very possible that microalgae can be used as a composite wound dressing. Because right now, the, the study that I conducted was in vitro. So there is a very long way to go until we can go into possible human test as well. But microalgae does definitely have the potential can, that can be used instead of the fish skin that is utilized normally in the industry right now. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Anyone? Any other questions? For Dr. Okay, uh, while waiting for the other <laughs> for the question, uh, Dr. Okra? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, another question from Anissa. Anissa, would you like to deliver the question directly? Hello, Dr. Okra. <laughs> Hello. My name is Anissa, and I have a question. We know that microalgae derived biomass has a lot of health advantages but is it economically profitable because up until now microalgae based functional food have not been utilized up to its potential capacity due to its high cost associated with microalgae harvesting harvesting step thank you yeah uh, thank you thank you for the question anisa um, actually it's true that it has not been utilized until now but I will not say that it is not economically profitable. It is economically profitable. It's just that it has not been done. Because I, I came across few of the industrial, industrial companies here, which did claim that they have made it economically profitable. They have made the technology in such a way that they have cut down all the cost that is possible up to every single cent so that they can try to utilize it as, let's say, biofuel. Because the biggest industry is biofuel right now. And competing with 
let's say petrol or diesel prices is really really difficult unless we get what is called subsidies but i did come across few companies which actually did say that oh no that's not true you can still figure out a way it's just that how so most of the, most of their process is very similar to conventional but they have tried to minimize the cost as much as possible so i would say in the next maybe 5 to 10 years or 15 20 years you will see that microalgae will be utilized as a biomass that can be economically profitable as well i hope that answers your question thank you so much for covering thank you yeah uh thank you anisa and thank you uh is pick up for the questions okay uh, dr prak one question related to the uh yeah the strategy to um extract the functional compound from microalgae uh, as you uh, show us uh, from the slide that um, we have ttp ltp and u LT, uh, ltp and also uh, lts as a strategy to uh, extract the functional compound from microalgae. But still, uh, I found the uh, recovery of the uh, lipid and also carbohydrates still uh, didn't uh, reach the point as the protein itself. Protein almost uh, more than 90, but uh, still the other, yeah. Do you think there's any other strategy or parameter that uh, influence this recovery? Actually, there are various different, how do you say, parameters that I still didn't complete. For example, in the studies that I conducted, I could have also, I used freeze-dried biomass. I, I could have used my wet biomass. Mm -hmm. And there are other strategies like trying to use different, uh, what is it called, cell disruption techniques. So there are different met methods by which I could have still increase my yield, but until now, what I did was try to get it on to a level where, okay, I can prove it's around 50 to 60%, then it can be further optimized. And maybe in the future, we can reach to 70% or 80% or higher. Okay, thank you. But still very worthy because using this system, we can get at the same time uh, for uh, each compound that, uh, Conventionally, we have to <laughs> use one by one, and then we got yes. lipid, and then uh, uh, we got uh, in with a different method uh, for carbohydrate and also protein. With this system, we can get at the same time uh, this uh, functional compound. Yes. Okay. Dr. Frog, thank you for a very uh, inspired uh, presentation today, and I hope everyone also got uh, inspiration from your uh, presentation. Okay. Again, thank you. Uh, and everyone now, <laughs> we come to the uh, last but not least, of course, <laughs> Dr. Cook. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Halley. Oh, sorry, sorry, Dr. Cook. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Halley. <laughs> yeah, please uh, kindly wait because still uh, there is a question from Dr. Afra from the. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Just please kindly wait. <laughs> Let me check for uh, from YouTube. Okay. Okay, uh, the question uh, from Ibu Kurnia, Ibu Kurnia and then, uh, microalgae has been known to have various kinds of bioactivity. Is it possible that microalgae can be used as an anti-inflammatory to prevent cytokine storm in COVID-19? Yes, definitely. It is possible. If not mistaken, that is one of the very hot topic right now going on in microalgae for COVID-19 that you can find a way how you can not cure in a way, but treat COVID-19 by microalgae. Do you use the uh, protein uh, compound for this uh, wound healing uh, active compound? Uh, for me, I didn't test out the active compounds from the proteins. I used it as a whole protein instead okay. of, yeah, yeah. I see. Hmm. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for, <laughs> for this uh, nice discussion. Um, okay, I guess no question from the participant and then we can uh, come to the 
last session of this general lecture. <laughs> Dr. Abroad, thank you for joining this uh, general lecture. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, uh, again, I will invite Dr. Ko. Dr. Ko, nice to meet you for the first time. Shall Hello, I? nice to meet you, Dr. Heli. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so directly you can start this session. Okay, my, I think my presentation will be quite short <laughs> because I think the, the top speakers already introduced about most of microalgae. So for my section, I just very brief through about my studies. Okay, so I, everyone can see my slides. Okay, let me share my slides. Okay, so again, very good evening to all speakers, future leaders, researchers. And thank you again, Dr. Halley for, from University uh, Pendidikan Indonesia for your kind invitation as the keynote speaker for today's lecture. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Ku Kuan Xiong. Um, and my research focuses is on the biorefinery of microalgae for the production of carotenoids. I've completed my bachelor's degree in chemistry from University Technology Petronas. And maybe some clue about Petronas is that Malaysia oil and gas companies, right? Uh, if you have a chance to visit Malaysia, where in Malaysia, the KL Tower, and then you have this uh, Petronas twin, twin tower that looks like the jagong, or we call it the corn structure, that, that is the the, the company itself, okay? Uh, so I've completed my PhD in University of Nottingham under the supervision of Prof. Shopalok. And so for today's uh, lecture will be about my PhD research, which is the green approaches and separation techniques for recovery of pigments from microalgae. Um, okay, so why do I in, look into this topic is because I found the, the essential needs of carotenoids or we call it vitamin C or we call it asacentin as so on. And we need it is because we human ourselves, we cannot produce it in our body. And these are the organic pigment that produce naturally from plants, algae, bacteria, and fungi. And carotenoid that comes in two shapes. One is carotin and one is central fuse. So in my focus, I'm focusing on astaxanthin, lutein, and fucosanthin. So they fall into the central fuse uh, category. Okay. Um, as you can see, these are the natural pigments that give colors to the flesh of aquatic animals. For example, this type of salmon, trops, and this crayfish, as you can see, the colors come from all this natural biomass from the water itself. And why is it important? It's because it has this highly antioxidant effect, which is beneficial for health diseases. That's why we human, we need to have supplement. The supplement that helps to prevent all these health diseases in our body. Okay. Um, what, how does it function is that it helps to deactivate these radicals in our body. We know that we are under the sun most of the time uh, for workers, maybe two hours, we have, we are, our body is subjected to UV and then our body has radicals. Then, so that's why we need, we need like these supplements from carotenoids to deactivate these radicals from our bodies. And why is it important for us? Because as I mentioned, human, we cannot produce carotenoids from our bodies. So we need direct supplement, all right? So from where? It's most, of, most of the time, it's from the fruits, vegetables, and that is from the World Health Organization. They mentioned that we need to consume five different types of colors of fruits and vegetables every day so that we can live healthily, okay? Um, moving on, so my research is to find an alternative native for the production of carotenoids. I will be using microalgae, and one of the microalgae is called Haemococcus pluris microalgae. Uh, the reason why I use this microalgae is because it has this high accumulation of astaxanthin, up to 3.85% of astaxanthin. Okay, as you can see, these are the microalgae. You can see from green color, and all you can see green, and then why is it red, and then why is it blue? So my microalgae is red color. As you can see, this is the microzoot, which is the baby stage. And then when it moves towards the red stage, it becomes the red color. So we need to, this process is like how we stress the microalgae. Uh, I believe uh, that will be much more subjective later on <laughs> into that topic. <laughs> um, however, in, to use this microalgae, which is Haemococcus pluris microalgae, uh, one of the challenges uh, I find is that it has this multi-layer structure. Yeah, this means it has three layer. So for order for me to extract astaxanthin, what I need to do is that I need to pre-treat this microalgae 
uh, in chemistry is that we need to break the cell wall of microalgae so that the astaxanthin will release out. Okay, simple as that. So what are the, okay, so this will be the over upstream and downstream of this microalgae is that we need to culture it, the, the normal microalgae process. We need to culture it. We need to optimize all these parameters, predictor prevention, design of photobioreactor and so on. And of course, biosynthesis where we need to stress the algae. For example, I heard one question that say that, uh, how do I, what do I need to do if I want my microalgae to produce more lipids? One way you can do it is that you stress them. You make sure that whether your algae is like favored towards this condition. If you stress them like nutrition starvation, if I didn't give the microalgae like nitrogen or phosphorus content or some of the micronutrients, then you can see, hey, why my microalgae will have more lipids? Or maybe if you give them more phosphorus, then you see why will they accumulate more protein? So that is like the way of how we stress the microalgae, okay? And one of the ways is also genetic modification. That is more towards the fifth generation or fourth generation of microalgae itself. Okay, let's not go into that. And then maturation. Maturation is for your microalgae to grow bigger. And harvesting process is to separate your microalgae from the culture medium because you want your microalgae to be in dry form. You don't want it to be wet, okay? Um, we have drying process, of course, the extraction process, that is what's happening. We want, we want to know how do we extract it. So my focus is more on the refinery process to, to extract the component from microalgae. Okay. Um, the technology I'll be using will be, have already been introduced from our, our research team, liquid biphasic flotation system. Okay. Maybe I'll just brief through the system itself. It's a fractionation technique uh, where we use to extract separate, purify, and enrich the protein, or we call it um, more target myobolecule on the surface. How does this work is that we put all the phase component. So what type of phase component, if you would like to ask, is that we have polymer, we have alcohol, we have ionic liquid. I believe most of the chemists here would understand what is ionic liquid. And also deep eutectic solvent, uh, surfactant, and also sugaring out. And when we combine into this system, it will eventually separate in two phase. So this is why we call it biphasic, okay? Where the top phase will recover the target biomolecule bio and the, the bottom phase is the impurities. So once we remove the, separate the impurities from the target biomolecule, that is why we say separation and purification process, okay? Um, so in this process, like Apurav did in his sharing, he also integrate like some of the technologies used in liquid biphasic flotation system, like ultrasound, like electric, microwave, and bubble assisted. So these are like the, the recent technologies that we can put in the LBF system, okay? Um, so talking about ionic liquid, I'm a, personally myself, I'm a chemist background. Uh, I'm not a chemical engineering background, so I know I know more about ionic liquid itself. I believe uh, for your from your side, Indonesia side, I believe most of chemistry, right? So if chemistry, I believe ionic liquid is like the fundamental thing for you to learn. Maybe during your final year project or during your research studies, you will come through this. Okay. So for those who do know what's ionic liquid, maybe a brief introduction. Ionic liquid is liquid composed of cation positive charge and negative charge and anion. So if you would ask, uh, how about sodium chloride, NaCl? Is that ionic liquid? That is not ionic liquid because that appears in solid form in room temperature. And ionic liquid needs to be in liquid form at room temperature, simple as that, okay? Uh, what makes them so special is because they have these distinguished properties like tunable chemical properties, high thermal stability, no vapor pressure, low melting point, and so on, okay? And that is how we engineer the ionic liquid to respective application, all right? However, right, when we talk about extraction, um, we want to extract the product. However, we do want the solvent to bind together with the extracted product. So the conventional ionic liquid, if you would heard about imidazolium, pyronidilium, those are the conventional type of ionic liquid. So uh, I did one experiment. I extract it using the imidazolium. Yes, I, I able to extract the bioactive compound from microalgae. However, the challenges here comes where we cannot separate the ionic liquid from the extracted product. So what is the point of extracting it in the beginning, right? So my research here, I designed one type of ionic liquid. It's called the carbon dioxide-based alkyl carbamide ionic liquid. So what does this ionic liquid do is that it can be easily separate from the product after the extraction process, okay? And one of the benefit, or we call it 
towards the greenness of the ionic liquid. Everyone say ionic liquid is not green, not green. However, when we talk about greenness of ionic liquid, we can actually incorporate like greenhouse gases. Like in my case, I'm using carbon dioxide to synthesize the ionic liquid. So it's like one of the ways I generate from uh, waste and then I create it into a product. Okay. And of course, when we talk about ionic liquid, cost is one of the things we need to consider. How about the cost? So when we talk about cost, ionic liquid can be recycled. So that is how we try to re mitigate or reduce the cost. Okay. Um, so what I did is that for extraction of astaxanthin, the first project I did is to use the LBF system. So the phase component is alcohol and salt bottom rich. And how do I do that is to put the bubble inside the system. And that is how we absorb the, the, the bioactive compound of astaxanthin. And this is how the mechanism works. Okay? And this system has been introduced widely for the extraction of protein, beta cyanin, lipase, phacocyanin. Okay, so we are not going to go that through again. Uh, talk about methodology. This is how it works. As you can see, the, the bottom part is the bubble and it will eventually carry the bioactive compound, like in my case, it's astaxanthin, to the top of the liquid biophysics system. And then it will deposit or concentrate the astaxanthin at top of the LBF system, okay? So this is how it looks like clearly at the first minute of the process. And then slowly when it accumulates, it will become a darker red, okay? So this is how the LBF system with the implementation of bubble assist in the technology. Uh, when we talk about LBF system, maybe some of the researchers asking about the technology and do know how the technology works. How we do? How do we uh, analyze or optimize this technology? Is that we can use partition coefficient, extraction efficiency to see how efficient in the extraction process, and we can we can also use the recovery yield to measure how much we have extracted from the initial compound and then from the last compound, all right? Some of the standard we can use is like to calibrate calibration curve. I believe uh, most of the uh, researcher will understand what is calibration curve. It's one of the conventional method to, to calculate a standard itself, okay? Uh, as mentioned from Dr. Chu uh, about LBF system, these are the type of parameters that we can monitor, like type of alcohol, the phase component, the sort, how does it in uh, interfect or affect the partition of the bioactive compound, the concentration, volume ratio, so on, okay? Um, from this research, what I get is around 78% of astaxanthin. However, right, I found that the limitation of this study is because uh, it undergoes a multi-step process or we call it a two-step pre-treatment. So the first step, I need to pre-treat the algae using the mortar and pestle, and then I subject it for the extraction process. And this is not so feasible because I believe most of the questions will relate to cost. So what I did is that I incorporate uh, the two systems into one system, which I will be introduced in my next project. So this is one of the technology from Apura project, which is the ultra assisted LBF system. We, we combine the extract the pre-treatment process along with the extraction process. As you can see, this is like to reduce the multi-step or we can reduce the economical cost of the overall process. As you can see, uh, how does this mechanism studies of ultrasound? Um, let's talk about chemistry-based knowledge. Lah. When we talk about chemistry-based knowledge, we talk about mechanism. We want to know what's ha actually happening. So when we talk about ultrasound, these are the three processes that is happening. We talk about combination. How do we combine? When the ultrasound are agitated, it will produce bubbles, tiny bubbles. So the bubbles will combine with one another and it will become bigger. Until a certain size, it will compress and then the third process is cavitate. So when it cavitate, it releases in the form of energy. So the energy eventually right, will help to pre-treat the microalgae. Like in my case, it's Hemococcus pruris microalgae. All right? And how do we want to understand the overall mechanism of how ultrasound works is that we study the cellular morphology using microscope. We study the surface morphology. I believe chemists will play a lot of uh, mechanism, not mechanism, I think it's instrument analysis, like uh, SEM, UVV, HPLC. Those are the like equipments we need to know, okay? It's like you can see the effect before and after treatment. This is the before the ultrasonication. You can see the surface is all like baby face. There's no wrinkle in that. But after the ultrasonic process, it will break into pores. And that, this is how the effect of ultrasound uh, helps in the pre-treatment and extraction of 
uh, astaxanthin, okay? But there's still limitation from my study. Of course, when we talk about research, we need to find our gap. We need to go in depth. We're not, they're not just talking about surface studies. We need to go more in depth about studies. So um, from this result, we, we have 83% compared to the previous result. However, the limitation or we call it the gap is that when we talk about ultrasound, the process is too intensive. So the overall process will heat up and then when it heat up, this will denature the sensitive properties of astaxanthin. We don't want that to happen because astaxanthin is a very sensitive biomolecule. Same goes to other like protein and I, I think not for lipid, for protein, um, uh, carotenoids type of protein like focosantin, lutins, those are very sensitive properties. We need to make sure that they are care or extracted in a nice, nicer way, okay? Um, so in my in my third scope, what I did is to implement ionic liquids. So I think most of the chemists like ionic liquid in this part. Um, first, I synthesis ionic liquid. The ionic liquid I synthesis is the CO two based alkyl carbamide ionic liquid. What I did is to use the carbon dioxide from the greenhouse gases to combine it with the amine, and then I form this. So if you ask amine, this one yes is toxic. But at the end product, no, this is not toxic because it's in the liquid form already compared to the gaseous form. The Yeah, something like that, okay? Uh, and then once we talk about the successful synthesis of ionic liquid, we will go for uh, characterization studies. So when we talk about characterization, characterization studies in a chemist view, we will use NMR. We will use NMR, FTIR to understand the structural or functional group like the OH hydroxy or the LQ, LQ chain or the carboxylic acid, okay? So that is how we characterize it. And then we use the ionic liquid, we synthesize, we test for the mechanism studies later on, okay? And then, of course, when we talk about mechanism studies, we want to know the interaction between the ionic liquid and also the biomass itself. Whether does it uh, permeabilize in this term we use ionic liquid instead of destruct, okay? And then last but not least, when we talk about cost, we need to talk about recyclability, of course. Um, I will, I will focus more about mechanism studies because uh, most of you are chemists here. Uh, when we talk about mechanism studies, we know that microalgae are plant-based material biomass, all right? So when we talk about plant-based material, they have this lignocellulose properties where they compose of cellulose, lignin, and hemicellulose, okay? So in this case, we talk about cellulose. Cellulose are most about like uh, hydroxy, hydroxy chain towards each other. So how do we want to break or de decellulose the structure, we put ionic liquid. So as you can see, the anion and the cation will eventually attack the hydroxy functional group of the, the, cell, the cell wall itself of the microalgae. So once they do this, eventually it will decellulose or create pore of the microalgae surface. Once a material have pore, right, the internal of the microalgae will release the astaxanthin out and then it will be easily to extract. As you can see, these are like the interaction that's happened of the cavity, the formation of cavities on the cellular surface. And this is the before treatment. You can see there's no uh, wrinkles or no pores from the microalgae, but after the treatment, you can see it's wrinkle. Okay, there's a pore. So these are like some of the studies. You can see the tiny, tiny pore that released the astaxanthin from the microalgae. So this is the clearer picture as you can see from the uh, cellulose studies. Okay, uh, recyclable studies, we talk about, we need to regenerate the cost. So I did up to three cycle because I noticed that there's a decrease. Uh, it might be due to the limitation of the ionic liquid and also because of the dissolution where my ionic liquid can be separated. But when it separated the process, right, uh, I found that there is some of the impurities from the, from the biomass actually accumulate in the ionic liquid. So, what happened is that this reduces the performance of the ionic liquid for the next study. That is why we need to do a purification of maybe ionic liquid later on, okay? Uh, that is for my astaxanthin studies. And then the second carotenoids is, we call it fucosantin. When we talk about fucosantin, this is uh, another type of uh, carotenoids. What, what the, this benefit is that it helps in anti-inflammatory, anti-diabetic, anti-cancer. And one of the most special about this fucosantin, right, as you can see from the structure, this is an, anti an antenna pigment. As you 
uh, most of the microalgae right, will carry photosynthesis process is because they have some minor part of this fucosantin in their composition. So this fucosantin is an antenna pigment right, that functions as the light housing complex in the microalgae. So what does it does is that it helps to transfer, capture and trans convert the energy right, for the microalgae to carry out the photosynthesis process. So it has the ability to trap the sunlight. That's why um, they say that microalgae will be the future uh, energy sources for, for, for in, in, our, in our research communities. So that is how like, this tiny, tiny function group, like carb this carbonyl that will help to trap the light harvesting thing that, go that goes on in this research. Okay, uh, We talk about fucosantin. Uh, in this chapter, I will talk about how what is the conventional way of extract fucosantin. Most of the downstream processing, they use the conventional extraction. We talk about uh, organic solvent, methanol, chloroform, uh, THF, and ethylene acid. These are not the what you call sustainable solvent because they are very toxic. They have this environmental impact and they are very uh, they use a very large volume to extract a process. That is why we say it's not feasible. That's why we need to use these emerging technologies. The current one has been published. It's up to the microwave assisted and also supercritical fluid. However, there's also limitation because there is use of energy process. When we talk about supercritical fluid, there's a big reactor. However, when you put 10 mil or 10 gram of biomass inside, you only can extract maybe certain 10%. Or maybe nine percent. So, but it uses a lot of energy. It's not uh, economical, sustainable in this in this uh, process. Okay. Um. So what I did is that I use back LBF system. However, I implement electro assisted technologies because I noticed that if I disrupt the cell, I will denature the properties of fucosantin. But if I permeabilize them, making them to have the pore from the surface that will be a milder way compared to ultrasonication. So this is what I did. Maybe I can introduce how does this electrolysis principle works. There are four types. One is pulse electric field, um, high voltage electric discharge, electrochemical cell. This is the one I'm using. And we also have moderate. I will talk about more about what I'm using. So when we talk about electrochemical cell, is the positive and negative uh, terminal and this will create an uh, electric field. When the cell is exposed to the electric field, this will eventually uh, par paralyze the cell. Once the cell is paralyzed, it will create pore of the cell membrane and then this fucosantin will release out from the pore. So this is how it works. The mechanism is like this type of mechanism. But uh, for resealing and memory, this will for the life mechanism. Like in my case, I'm using the, the lysis one. The microalgae, the microalgae right, is already in the powder form. It's not in the live microalgae. So we start, I will I, I study until the stabilization. Okay. So in this studies, right, uh, is it has a very high recovery yield of fucosantin. And also in terms of separation efficiency, we don't have to worry. It's because the LBF system is already very established to separate the compound, okay? And the last scope, I also use the same ionic liquid, but this time I use it to extract fucosantin. As mentioned from Prof show that uh, microalgae has been established that they have many types of the bioactive compound. It's just that you need to use the right method to extract them. So in my case, I use back the same ionic liquid to extract different type of compound. Okay. So this is much clearer. This is before treatment and this is the after treatment. You can see that the ionic liquid can create more pore from this compared to this. So this is what we call about permeabilization. Um, some of the characterization studies, this is the ionic liquid. When we synthesize it, we need to understand uh, whether does it have the CO stretching and this is the carbamate uh, symmetric. We can, we can see this from the wave, wave number. And this is like some of the structure, all right? And the current studies, they use it to extract. I mean, I, I, I introduced them that maybe some future work to use about ionic liquid is to extract CPC, c phacosinin from spirulina microalgae. It's also feasible, okay? Uh, some of the microscope studies and the results from com as compared to the electric 
is that we can see that the ionic liquid is much more performing than the, the, previous, the previous technology, okay? All right, so maybe I'll end my presentation with uh, a video I, I, I did for my research. Hi, my name is Jerry. My PhD research focuses on the downstream bioprocessing of I think there's there's no there's no voice, right? I did not share the voice. We can hear the voice. We can hear the voice. Oh, you can hear the voice. Okay, okay. Okay. Hi, my name is Jerry. My PhD research focuses on the downstream bioprocessing of carotenoids from microalgae. Microalgae are renewable and sustainable sources of biofuels and bioactive compounds over conventional fossil fuels. However, the use of conventional solvent inherent toxicity on its end product. Also, the microalgae involves a pre I think, Dr. Jerry, we cannot see the video. Process. Oh, you cannot see the video. Hmm, maybe you can reshare again. Yeah, we only can see your face. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, how how do I share? Okay. We can see the video. Okay, let me know if there's sound. <laughs> Else, we can we can go to the Q and A section. <laughs> Yeah, good now. Downstream bioprocessing of carotenoids from microalgae. Microalgae are renewable and sustainable sources of biofuels and bioactive compounds over conventional fossil fuels. However, the use of conventional solvent inherent toxicity on its end product. Also, microalgae involves a pre treatment step before the extraction process. Therefore, my research implemented two types of green and sustainable technology, which are liquid biphasic flotation system and ionic liquids. The fundamental principles of this system consists of the top and bottom phase, along with the air bubbles to absorb the surface activities of bio compounds. The more advanced of this system can be incorporated with the ultrasound technology and electric assistant technology, making more convenient process. So, speaking of ionic liquids, my research synthesis and environmental green carbonate ionic liquid, which utilizes carbon dioxide as one of the raw material. One of the remarkable features of this CO2 ionic liquid is that it can be easily separated from the extracted compound after the extraction process, unlike the conventional ionic liquid, which composed of high thermal stability, which could nature these sensitive properties of carotenoids. Lastly, the extracted compound will then be subjected to qualitative analysis using the HPLC and UVB spectral photometer to evaluate the carotenoid properties. With that said, I believe my research contributes to a greener and environmentally friendly bioprocessing approach that enhances the microalgae research competitors. Okay, so thank you once again uh, for the kind invitation, Dr. Heli, uh, for as the keynote speaker. And for more information, you can always email me regarding future research collaboration. You can also visit my some of my research platform from Google Scholar Research Gate or uh, Publon. So to always end my presentation, I always have this quote that I always tell future researcher to always see. Uh, what everybody everybody else have seen and to think nobody else have thought. So if today, if you know something, that does not give you the power, but to believe, to believe something, that gives you the power to move on. So with that said, I would like to pass, uh, open the floor for questions and answers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jerry. And also, uh, thank you for very nice uh, closing presentation. Okay, uh, everyone, now uh, we come to the uh, question and answer session. Okay. Okay. Uh, you can write your questions in the chat box or uh, you can also directly uh, ask your question to uh, Dr. Jerry. <laughs> I have a question. Hi. <laughs> uh, uh, Lisa? Okay. Yes. Mm. 
Okay, so thank you so much, Dr. Jerry. Uh, previously, you mentioned about uh, pre treatment, also, you mentioned about the antenna photosynthetic. What my question is is there any modification needed on the antenna photosynthetic, photosynthetic apparatus of microalgae to match the degree of photosynthetic saturation with the intensity of sunlight for achieving high content of pigment? Thank you so much. Uh, sorry, I, I don't get the, the middle, the middle uh, question. Okay, so is there any modification needed on the antenna photosynthetic, photosynthetic to achieve high content of pigment? Uh, when we talk about, yeah, that is, thank you for the question. That, that is a very critical question. Um, actually, for microalgae, because we know that it's very small cell, they have a certain accumulation of uh, carotenoids in their body. So imagine if, uh, like let's say that the cell is one gram, it's impossible for the whole cell to accumulate 90% of the carotenoids in their body because they need maybe other parts like proteins, lipids to eventually generate this substance in their body itself. So um, I can say that it can go up to 10 to 20%, but it will not covers all the, the part of algae you want. Like for example, lipid, you cannot expect uh, that the algae, one gram, has one gram of lipid. That is unrealistic. <laughs> I hope I answer your question. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Jerry. Thank you for the questions. Any other questions from the other participants? Yeah, I think Mia, Mia got a question. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so what are the advantages of extraction with ionic liquids over other methods? Um, I still believe that ionic liquids are future solvents because there's an article saying that ionic, ionic liquids are the potential future solvents over conventional ionic liquid. Uh, the reason why we say uh, ionic liquid is better is because it has higher efficiency um, on a layman term, like with chemistry, right? That we, when we talk about chemistry, we know that uh, ionic liquid has functional group like OH, has like carboxylic acid, those type of functional group. So when we talk about extraction, we know that what we want to extract, we just need to put the key input. Like if the if the extraction requires OH, it will be more uh, lipophilic or hydrophilic or hydrophobic. We can control or we can design the ionic liquid based on the extraction process itself. Unlike if we use like the conventional uh, solvent, right, like methanol, that is only OH. So that will be more towards lipophilic or oil oil like like base. But if your compound is uh, water based, it will not be extracted out. So that is how we play with ionic liquid. I hope I answer your question. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yes, your answer has already answered also many other questions. Uh, any other questions? I can see most most of the <laughs> most of the uh, participants are chemistry based. <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh, mostly uh, today participants is um, come from chemistry department. Ah, um, okay. So, um, I believe that today, uh, yeah, lecture will also inspire all of them to get uh, more idea, especially for the uh, vinyl uh, research. Yes, yes. Know? Yeah, yeah. Yes, maybe, maybe some words from my side. Um, as a chemist, you can always do similar thing than an engineer. An engineer looks at a big process, but for a chemist, we look at the tiny process, but that doesn't mean that the tiny process won't contribute to a bigger production. Mm -hmm. So that is how we chemists comes into play to make things happen. Without mm -hmm. that, I mean, without the chemist, the engineer will not have the <laughs> overview of the process, but as a chemist, we know what's happening. So I believe all chemists here <laughs> will yeah. be inspired by that. <laughs> <laughs> Ya, uh, sangat menginspirasi ya, uh, ada-ada mahasiswa semuanya, Bapak uh, 
bahwa uh, kimia ini uh, sangat mewarnai banyak gitu ya uh, termasuk dalam uh, pengembangan teknik-teknik uh, biokimia gitu ya karena uh, kita akan melihat dari sisi uh, bagaimana reaksi kimia ini bisa sebetulnya dimodifikasi untuk menghasilkan uh, sesuatu yang memang uh, bisa uh, kemudian menghasilkan sesuatu yang lebih baik dari uh, sebelumnya gitu ya So uh, as uh, Professor Shaw also mentioned that um, chemists can also contribute to yeah to uh, invent novel uh, yeah novel strategy to find out yeah to find out the uh, best way to get a functional product. So uh, I'm totally I totally agree with uh, your opinion that chemists can also uh, make contribution when seeing in the uh, tiny tiny thing any process from the, yeah from any process <laughs> yeah we are like the fundamentals for them to create the whole <laughs> conceptualization plan <laughs> <laughs> and seeing what the process behind of the uh, yes. yeah, uh, behind of the step that uh, the engineer created hmm. Okay, uh, any other questions from uh, all of the uh, participants? From, okay, any other questions? Okay. Yeah, let me check from the YouTube. There's any other questions. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Dr. Cherry, uh, sorry for miss the uh, the the step of the how you use the um, hematococcus uh, propialis as the source for uh, getting uh, astaxanthin. Okay. Yes. Um, as far as I know, that this uh, pigment couldn't normally uh, produced by this strain, so we have to uh, give a stress to the strain to get uh, to get this product. But uh, uh, just recently, I found that you already got this biomass with the uh, highly content of astaxanthin. Or uh, did you also uh, did treatment to uh, yeah, to treat the uh, hematococcus itself to produce the astaxanthin? Oh, actually, uh, in my case, we I'm not able to get the live strain. Uh, of astaxanthin, the hemococcus pruris. So what I did is that I purchased it from a company that produced hemococcus pruris, micro the astaxanthin, uh, and then that is how I do the extraction. Mm -hmm. And I also visited, I think, Kobe University, and they, they do have the live strain, and they actually show me the, the real hemococcus strain that is green and how they stress them into red. So that is very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah, normally it uh, has a green color. Then uh, when color we some stress, some proper uh, stress. I mean, because we couldn't uh, do uh, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, we have to do a proper uh, stress to this uh, strain to produce the astaxanthin, and then they will uh, produce this pigment to the uh, even to the medium if I'm mistaken. And then we can easily to get it. Yeah, one one way we can stress the algae is that we can put high intensity of light. So once the algae feel threatened, or for example, most of the organism, if you feel threatened, you will find a way to protect yourself. So once you find a way to protect yourself, you will start to uh prevent yourself from being dangerous, something like that. So same goes to this algae, they are live microorganism, uh, what they do is that they will form three layer, which is the, the, the one I mentioned, the tri-layer, the second layer, and the, another layer inside. So they try to protect themselves from dying. One is from dying, and the second, they want to produce food. So how do they produce food is that they need to biosynthesize themselves, and then like they can consume astaxanthin themselves also, like to convert the energy for them to photosynthesis. Yeah. So that is like how they, they stress themselves to produce <laughs> astaxanthin. <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, nicely because astaxanthin is uh, really highly content uh, yeah, uh, and it can act as uh, the best antioxidant. 
so far. Yes, um, it has um, the highest antioxidants yeah, properties. Yeah. Yes. yes. Mm. And uh, uh, now, uh, uh, go through the uh, strategy for the bio refinery system that you uh, develop for a uh, uristed. Um, with uh, using the system, uh, can you get also other pigment at the same time? Using uh, yes, that system will extract everything. <laughs> so <laughs> it is uh, easily to separate other pigment also. I mean, um, astaxanthin from uh, also other pigments. That Usually, astaxanthin they will come along with protein and chlorophyll. Mm -hmm. Yes. So how do we separate then? Is that we need to use membrane? But I did not look in that part to be very honest, because to do the membrane process, that is very time consuming. So what I did is that I tested using LBF system. Uh, for LBF system, yes, we can purify it, but not, not that high. There's still a little bit of the carotene or chlorophyll accumulate inside. But what the LBF system is that, that is good, right, is that it can help to separate the biomass from the pigment itself. So that is how they comes into play. But for further purification, of course, we need to use like membrane dialysis process to further enhance the purity of the compound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, any other questions? Uh, still, you can uh, write your questions in the chat box and then uh, discuss with uh, Dr. Jerry. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Dr. Heli, for the kind invitation again. I will pass <laughs> the floor to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, okay. Uh, any questions? Okay. Um, yeah, uh, Dr. Jerry, thank you for uh, also a nice uh, topic for today, I guess, lecture. And thank you to all of you. Uh, yeah, Professor Shaw, Dr. Chu, and also Dr. Clark, and also Dr. Jerry for uh, giving a very uh, interesting topic for today, guest lecture. Still, we have another lecture also with a different topic in the uh, next session. And everyone, uh, please kindly join the uh, next session of the guest lecture. Uh, and I will inform the uh, link uh, for the uh, second lecture. And um, let me uh, make um, uh, briefly uh, resume for this uh, guest, today's guest lecture. So mycology has been known as, um, yeah, as one of the attractive uh, bioresources due to its easiness to grow and also highly content for many bioactive compounds. But still, we have concern with the utilization of this microalgae because uh, we still have to uh, study, uh, especially to make it become economically resources. Here, all of the speaker uh, put, uh, in, uh, put attention uh, in, to improve the cost of effectiveness of the product processing, and then to develop efficiency of biorefinery uh, processing and uh, to create the algae as renewable uh, sources. So the modification can be done from downstream and also from uh, upstream. So from the upstream, you can choose the targeted algae that you want to extract the uh, functional compound, but still we have also another um, best way to uh, modify this strategy from the uh, downstream. One of the strategies is um, yeah, uh, utilizing or in, um, making invention in bio uh, refinery uh, processing to extract, to separate, to purify, and also to enrich the biomedical accumulation. So uh, that is for today, uh, the show. And Again, thank you for uh, all of you, and thank you for uh, giving a um, very, very interesting uh, topic for uh, all of the participants, and also uh, give many inspiration from your research. Okay.
And uh, also, I would like to say a thank you for all the participants who already joined this uh, guest lecture. And see you again in the next uh, guest lecture. But just before I forget, <laughs> let me share the uh, uh, list of attendance. And then you can uh, fill in the uh, list from the link that I will share in the chat box. And just before we close the session, I would like to take picture with uh, all of the speaker. Please kindly wait and then you can uh, switch on your camera uh, to take uh, the picture with all of the speaker who has already uh, delivered the uh, interesting topic for uh, this first guest lecture series. Okay, okay please kindly wait. Okay, we have four layer, and then okay, everyone, <laughs> please give your best smile, and then one, two, three. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, one, two, one, two, three. Wait a minute. Okay, move to the second layer. Just please switch on your camera. Okay, one, two, three. Okay. okay. Move to the third layer. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, and the last layer. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, uh, we have already got all of the documentation for today's guest lecture. And I believe all of you not only got your, uh, yeah, get your documentation with other, uh, with all of the uh, keynote speakers, uh, even virtually, but I believe you, all of you uh, already got also the inspiration from what uh, they did, especially for uh, the research that uh, they have been done, especially in microalgae uh, area. So one more, I would like to say thank you for uh, all of the speaker 
And then thank you to all of you, uh, who, uh, to all participants who already joined this case lecture. Okay, see you again in the uh, next case lecture. And then thank you to all of you. And see you again. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for the show. Thank you. Dr. Thank you. Dr. Thank Dr. Jerry. Bye-bye. Okay. Bapak Ibu terima kasih untuk partisipasinya. Ada ada mahasiswa juga terima kasih sudah bergabung. Selamat bertemu lagi nanti di kuliah umum berikutnya. Terima kasih Bu. Sami Sami. Jangan lupa diisi daftar hadirnya ya. Terima kasih Bu. Terima kasih Bu. Terima kasih Bu. Sami Sami.